you've all been following the U.S. election. Uh, even if you're not in the U.S., uh, I'm, I'm sure you wish you had a chance to vote against Trump, all of you, and I wish you had. But as everyone saw, the, the Republicans did a lot better uh, than, than expected. Trump's appeal uh, uh, to racial identity uh, was, was a lot more successful, I, I think, than even uh, some pessimists expected. And uh, these categories like white women, I think about 52% voted for Trump, white men, about 58%. And the media is all talking about how the suburbs shifted to Trump, the middle class, the white, which they mean white middle class. That's not in fact what happened. What happened was a massive turnout of black and Latino and other people of color. Latino uh, vote for the first time uh, the turnout was equal to the white per turnout. And that's and there's also a narrative in the media that the, like, some Latinos voted for uh, Trump. But uh, as you'll see in the article that Hudis and I wrote, that's probably the less important phenomenon. But there's huge dangers ahead. There's the danger still of some type of a uh, cool like situation because because Trump, we just don't know how Trump's base is going to react to his appeals. There's a rally going on right now in Washington, DC. There's also huge dangers down the road, even if Trump leaves, because he shows no sign of all, he shows every sign of wanting to keep leadership of the Republican party, even if he leaves. Uh, with uh, the Republicans controlling the Senate, if they radicalize, they can block almost everything. They can even block all cabinet appointments if, if they want to. So we could really have a, almost like a dual power. Um, and uh, it's a very it remains a dangerous situation, although of course it's a sigh of relief that Trump uh, uh, was, def was defeated at the polls. Uh, and also just in terms of numbers, I calculated if 80,000 votes had switched in those swing states out of 100, over 100, 150 million, Trump would be president. So that's how close it actually was. It wasn't just the first, that's the way our, our, our biased uh, system, elect, uh, 18th century constitution. That, uh, uh, we're gonna have uh, two sessions with four speakers and then a discussion, then a half hour break, then four more speakers. Uh, the overall theme, we made it very general because we had no idea how the election was gonna turn out. Where do we go from here? Global revolutionary perspectives on the present moment. And we wanted to make it not just about the US, we wanted to cover revolutionary movements and of course challenges to them all over the world, which I think we're, we're gonna be able to do as well as uh, the theoretical challenges. Uh, this conference is sponsored by the IMHO and I just wanna read one, two sentences about that in case you don't know us. Uh, the International Marxist Humanist Organization aims to develop and project a viable vision of an alternative to capitalism, a new human society that can give direction to today's freedom struggles. The IMHO is based on the unique philosophical contributions that have guided Marxist humanism since it was founded in the 1950s by Raya Donievskaya. We do so by working out a unity of theory and practice, worker and intellectual and philosophy and organization. And so, but this conference uh, is broader than a normal Marxist humanist thing because we have several speakers who are not members of the IMHO. It, it's, it's an attempt to have a public, very public dialogue and everyone is, is welcome, uh, even if you have uh, disagreements with us. So uh, let's just go on uh, with the speakers. I'll introduce them uh, one by one because that way as people trickle in, uh, they'll hear the introductions to the speakers. And we're gonna go in the order that's in the program. So uh, our first speaker will be Zahur Ahmad, a Kashmiri Marxist educator. And uh, let me just say uh, something here about uh, Zahur. He studies South Asia's international relations, political theory, Marxism, particularly the dynamics of the Kashmir imbroglio and the geopolitical triangle involving Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan. He is also doing political theory and Marxism, having, writ having written on critical theory in the context of international relations, gender in neoliberalism, religion and the secularization of civil life, and the continuing relevance of Karl Marx. And his, ti his title is 
repression and struggle on the subcontinent. So go ahead, uh, Zahur. Okay. Uh, hello, comrades. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, comrades. Uh, I feel honored that IMHO gave me such an opportunity to share my ideas with you people. As for my talk is concerned, it is divided into three parts. The first part deals with a very brief overview of the Indian state since Narendra Modi came into force in 2014. The second part deals with the Kashmir problem. And the final part critically examines the Indian democracy, though these three parts are related to one another. Let me begin. When we look at Indian politics, it is heavily dominated by the communal versus non-communal fault line. Indeed, it is a critical one. The non-communal approach believes that no single community or its culture is the basis of Indian nationalism. The approach views that the Indian nation is a product of a more complex and socio-cultural existence. The first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, argued that the composite culture of India is one of its greatest strengths. This idea was, however, refuted by the Hindu nationalist parties and pointed out that India is not a multicultural society, but a majoritarian nation state. They believe that the Hindu community's cultural religious identity and practices form the foundation of India's nation state. It was in the 1920s, before independence, Hindu nationalist ideology was codified by V.D. Savakar in his famous work, Hinduta, who is a Hindu. He argued that culturally India is a Hindu country and aims to transform it into Hindu Rashtra. That means Hindu nation state. Expressing itself in cultural terms, Hindu nationalism is a political movement seeking to purify culture and establishment of a Hindu polity. Therefore, Hindu nationalists view India as a Hindu Rashtra not only because of majoritarianism, but consider themselves as the true sons of the soil. They also imagine the Hindu community as consisting of all castes, sub-castes, outcastes, along with Buddhist Sikhs and Jains. All these religions they call indigenous. However, Christians and Muslims as religious minorities are castes as bloody foreign invasions or denationalizing influences and whose loyalty to India is suspect. For Hindu right-wing groups, violence, religious conversion, and illegal infiltration are the three major tools deployed by Islam and Christianity to defeat Hindus and take over India. In addition, Christians and Muslims were always the primary enemies, although over time socialism, Marxism, secularism have been added to this list. In the recent past, the tension inherent in, in these competing visions have come to the forefront, especially since Mr. Narendra Modi regime came into power in 2014. When Narendra Modi entered into office in May 2014, after a spectacular victory for the BJP, he promised to bring India a chedin, that means good days, by which he meant economic development, prosperity, more jobs, combating corruption and good governance. But his neoliberal policies led to drastic reductions in social development outlay with cuts in public expenditure on basic education and primary health care. Moreover, there are many controversial issues that either define the Hinduta agenda or seek to mobilize Hindu on, on a religious basis and reduce non-Hindus to second class citizens and secondary status. These issues consist of social campaigns with regressive anti-minority messages, attacks on places of worship, undermines the strength that autonomy of political institutions, concerted abuse attacks on critical academicians, filmmakers, and progressive media, emboldened Hindu militant organizations, privileging of Hindu symbolism identities, dissenters and critics routinely labeled as anti-national, the legitimizing of interfaith marriage and censorship of non-governmental organizations. Hindu vigilante groups appear to be more bare-faced, impertinent, bullish, truculent, proud and malevolent than ever before. In November 2016, the Modi regime unexpectedly announced overnight to invalidate and replace 500,000 rupee bank notes, around 80% of the currency then in circulation in an act of demonetization. Mr. Modi justified demonetiza demonetization in terms of cracking down on the black money, counterfeiting and corruption. In his speech, defining Defending the policy, he also cited boosting revenues by 
limiting tax evasion forcing money into banks and encouraging the use of digital payment this development however drastically affects the economy causes distress to farmers and small traders shaved off at least two percentage points of country's annual gdp growth rate pushing up depositors and tax receipts when social and economic disruption unfolded that followed the poorly planned policy initiative modi quickly labeled critics and dissenters of his policy as supporting black marketers and acting against the interest of the nation even one of his chief ministers in in maharashtra declared that those who questioned of demonetization were nothing but internationals alongside right wing hindu nationalists have tried to discipline minorities with consent of the state apparatus using a kind of cultural policing that had earlier been restricted to bjp ruled states particularly in gujarat and uttar pradesh it has however also spread beyond bjp ruling states such hindu vigilantism has manifested in a range of ways to challenge the very idea of india and its principles including democracy and secularism the right wing groups have targeted muslims accused of seducing and marrying young hindu women to convert them a phenomenon labeled as lau jihad one of the hindu ta ideology argued that a key plan of muslims is to i quote allure attract and abduct young hindu girls for marriage to the muslims unquote indeed the notion of muslim men preying upon hindu girls is common sense in hindu ta thinking this was followed by the ghar wapsi that means literal that means returning back home which intended to reconvert christians and muslims to the hindu faith as a reaction to muslim and christian pluralism the other symbolic issue is cow protection it has long been a major concern for hindu right wing forces on the basis that cows are sacred animals in their culture this is a useful mechanism to organize activists and a new movement was established called gao rakshak dal however it is an indirect way to stigmatize muslims as muslims eat beef and thousands of workers in the meat industry it has also severe implications both for religion based policy and cultural diversity there have been continued killings and beatings over the controversial topic of bee ban other developments included first in the past 8 years a systematic attempt has been made to change the textbooks in order to revise historiography in line with hindutva view of history second anxiety and fear increased surveillance through the use of biometric unique identity verification system known as aadhaar it threatens the privacy of people also it it is dubbed the world's biggest mass surveillance project third recently the citizenship amendment act 2019 enacted it is discriminatory and intended to target and marginalized muslims for the first time religion is a basis for granting citizenship the act seeks to grant citizen rights to religious minorities of neighboring muslim majority countries of afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan based on religion which violates secular and pluralist principles including article 14 deals with right to equality and article 15 deals with non discrimination of the indian constitution besides these developments modi marched to kashmir india's only muslim majority state and unveiled his propaganda throughout the most part of kashmir history people have suffered despotism oppression repression dehumanization and misrule they have been ruthlessly and repressively ruled by the shahmiris chaks afghans mughals sikhs and dogras before the two new entities india and pakistan arrived in 1947 and leaving them in abject penury thus the history depicts the kashmir i quote remained colonized and its natives disempowered unquote kashmir emerged as a contentious region between india and pakistan the two dominant major powers in south asia shortly after their respective emergence as sovereign states in 1947 following the end of the british rule kashmir is one of the most intractable international conflicts today it has led to three major wars constant endemic instability and instability not only in india pakistan region but in the entire south asia also it is the most densely militarized zone in the world now since the 1990s what indian regimes have done in kashmir is deplorable and unforgivable millions of people have been killed thousands have been disappeared in this conflict 
it is pertinent to mention here that since Modi came to power, the violence exacerbated in the valley. Over the last few years, hundreds of people, particularly teenagers, have been killed and blinded by the use of pellet gun, pellet firing shotguns, the security establishment and new weapon to control the public. Until COVID-19 reached Kashmir, the valley was locked down for seven long months after the Indian government on 5 August 2019 abrogated Article 370 and 35A and brought Jammu and Kashmir directly under the federal rule for the first time since 1947. The state was also divided into two autonomous territory, union territories, one Jammu and Kashmir and the other is Ladakh. It is, legis it is legislature has been disempowered. The move was unconstitutional, authoritarian and illegal. Moreover, the decision took without the consent of the people and people have been disenfranchised. They have been incarcerated at their homes and thousands including mainstream leaders have been arrested. The move was greeted with protests. It was claimed that Modi's real intention is to inundate the region with Hindu settlers. Bearing the two districts, Gandharbal in Kashmir division and Udhampur in Jammu division, internet service remains very slow, that is 2G. In the modern, I mean, in the, in the 21st century, we are without high-speed internet. The above two sanctions raise a very serious and important question about the Indian democracy. The question is like this, is Indian democracy dead? Democracy properly understood in, is the context in which citizens freely engage in the process of broad-based discourse, debate, deliberation, and enhance the critical assessment without any fear, restraint, and unease. People enjoy greater freedom and human development in well-functioning democracies than citizens of non-democracies. They also experience less deprivation, violence, suppression, dehumanization, and domination. Therefore, it is robust and a vibrant mechanism provides more pluralism and more tolerance. It is not like what Thomas Hobbes opined that democracy fosters destabilizing among the subjects. Though it entails freedom and tends to encourage people to think rationally because it, it makes a difference, difference whether people do so or not. It also rescues ordinary people from both the tyranny and mayhem and promotes human welfare, fairness, public deliberation, individual freedom, security, and social equality. We should also bear that freedom depends on more than rights, but without rights, there is no freedom. While dealing with democracy, a few questions arise in my mind. Is Indian democracy dead? If not, does it provide genuine autonomous choices to the citizens and institutions, and do people enjoy political thinking? Democracy appears so innocuous in India. In his famous terrorist with destiny speech at midnight of August 14, 1947, Jawala Nehru, the first prime minister, had brilliantly posed, what shall be our endeavor? He elegantly answered, I quote, to bring freedom and opportunity to the common man, to the peasants and workers of India, to fight and end poverty and ignorance and disease, to build up a process prosperous, democratic, and progressive nation, and to create social, economic, and political institutions, which will ensure justice and full fullness of life to every man and woman." Unquote. These objectives remain as aspiring as they have been elusive. Whatever may have been the vision of the founding fathers of this nation, it is democracy hasn't delivered up to their expectations. The democratic values and norms have had been attacked under all the regimes since 1947. The first blow came when Indira Gandhi declared the emergency in 19, 1975. It was followed by anti-Sikh rights in 1984, demolition of Babri Masjid in December 1992, anti-Muslim rights in Gujarat in, in 2002, abrogation of Article 370 and 35A in Jammu and Kashmir in 2019, and the list is going on. Thus, these developments undermine the citizens' allegiance to the very idea of democracy. In addition, what we are experiencing today is the abating of the values of self-expression. These have had a significant impact on the democratic institutions because these values are inherently pertinent to the political and civil rights that constitute democracy. In the existing system, it seems more fragile, volatile, and blemished because of serious internal internal cleavages and more sensitive and divisive issues. It gave birth to forces of authoritarian and anti-democratic nature and more backlashes against individual choices and autonomy. 
as a result in a democracy seems unworkable and lies in tatters the censorship that the present regime is executing seriously kills the foundational values of the republic moreover the modi government sought to crush criticism and dissent through the use of coercive powers and anti terrorist laws particularly the draconian unlawful activities to control the public in a state of engaging in a constructive dialogue with them the act allows the state to designate individuals as terrorists without following the due process of a first information report charge sheet trial and conviction under this draconian law many progressive intellectuals students and activists were detained so far even judiciary refused to grant bail to several key detainees and the indian democracy is suffering varying combination of corruption over security lack of transparency death of free speech and intractable conflicts the competition is also collapsing the democratic principles are pitted with the communal agendas in short life is pretty grim in the world so called a largest democracy the mythical version of democracy becomes more clear and plain to speak of the defense of democracy as if we are defending something that became self deception and pretense the criterion simply rests in the question of where power resides and how it is exercised it becomes more or less synonymous with the rule of the mob which leads to the demise of individual freedoms and rights the modi government has been terrible for for most minorities dissenters activists rationalists environmentalists progressive universities social and economically discriminated groups such as dalits and women and other oppressed tribes and castes to name a few today the un- unemployment rate is very high the banking system is fragile and weak and the acute undercapitalized with poor credit disbursement several severe agrarian crises and miseries have caused farmer suicides and it is increasing day by day and the economy continues to suffer painful effects of neoliberal policies thank you so much Thank you Zahur and I just want to underline I should have said it before that Zahur was speaking to us from Kashmir and that's why to the last minute we weren't sure about the internet connection because part of the repress repression of the system is to uh, slow down the internet so we're very very lucky to have 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 him and we're very lucky also to have our as our next speaker Gilbert Ashkar uh, Gilbert Ashkar is a I uh, grew up in Lebanon and has researched and taught in Beirut, Paris and Berlin. He's currently a professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. He's published over 15 he's he's in he's published in over 15 languages and a number of books, uh, quite a few I can't even list them all but two of the uh, most widely read and maybe the best Marxist analyses of the crisis and revolutions in the Middle East, the people want 2013 and morbid sy- symptoms 2016 but he uh, also has done theoretical work including his book Marxism Orientalism and Cosmopolitanism which offers critiques of Edward Said uh, and uh, Gilbert uh, is uh, is speaking on the ongoing revolutionary process in the Middle East a decade on thank you Thank you Kevin and uh, greetings to 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 all nice uh, being with you on this occasion um right so we have 15 minutes uh and of course this is a, a very broad topic but uh, I'll try to to go to the essential in in 15 minutes and uh, uh, I presume uh, we have enough time for the discussion after all after that uh, for any issues that anyone want would want me to 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 clarify um uh, as you probably know uh we're we're about to mark not to say uh, celebrate the the 10th anniversary of uh, of this uh, huge uh, upheaval in the uh, arabic speaking uh, world that uh, started Uh, uh in uh, in december 2010 so we're very close to the uh, 10th anniversary 17 december 2010 is the the day when uh, a young uh, tunisian man a street vendor uh, set himself on fire and uh, and that was the the beginning of this uh, to, to use a an easy metaphor here a wildfire that uh, that uh, 
um, spread to the, the, the whole, practically to all the, uh, the Arabic speaking countries. Uh, that is uh, no, no, no country of, uh, of, of the, the region was spared. Uh, every country in the region saw a major rise in, in social protest. Well, with very few ex uh, exceptions, but uh, they are very artificial states like uh, Qatar or United Arab Emirates, which are states uh, uh, and uh, a couple of other uh, Gulf uh, monarchies. They are states with, where the, the overwhelming majority of the population are migrants, up to 90%. So that gives you an idea of how how uh, artificial they, they have been constructed, how artificial they have been constructed by, by British uh, imperialism, actually. Um, so with this, with this exception, there's practically no other, uh, no major country in the region that hasn't seen an, uh, big, uh, an upsurge in, in uh, social protest in the, in the year 2011. And uh, six countries, uh, that is five after Tunisia, went into a full, uh, uprising mode. That is, in, in, in six countries, which are Tunisia, which were fo followed by Egypt, um, Yemen, uh, Libya, uh, Syria, and uh, Bahrain. Uh, so a total of six countries uh, uh, witnessed major uprisings, that is, uprising aiming at overthrowing the government, overthrowing uh, the regime, which was the the most ubiquitous uh, uh, slogan of, uh, of that time, the people want to overthrow the regime, um, in Arabic, of course. Um, so uh, that, that was, as you, you know, because this formula is still being used, that, that was dubbed the Arab Spring uh, by, by the media generally, with this uh, tendency to use spring for any uh, periods of, uh, of uh, upsurge, uprising against uh, dictatorships. Uh, uh, but of course, the, 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 the term itself um, uh, was not the void of, uh, of, uh, of illusions. It was actually loaded with, with, with the illusion that, that it would, that first, that was essentially a, uh, an issue of democratization as you had in uh, some other parts of the world at some, uh, historical junctures and uh, uh, you have a whole literature on, uh, on the transition to democracy. Um, and uh, the, the, the other illusion was that it would be um, relatively smooth and, uh, and uh, brief or short, in sh short duration. Um, that's also what the term spring uh, uh, could, uh, could mean. And so you, so you had a lot of euphoria in, uh, in 2011 around the Arab Spring, uh, and at the same time, a lot of, of illusion, uh, but the illusion did not uh, last long because precisely the, 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 the upsurge, the, the, this revolutionary shockwave of uh, 2011 uh, lost momentum in 2012 and then was, completely reversed the year after 2013, when one of the dominoes, if we use the domino theory here, uh, one of the dominoes, which is the Syrian regime, resisted the, the, the wave and uh, was backed by Iran into uh, uh, restoring its, uh, its power. And uh, that was the, 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 the signal, if you want, of a uh, of, uh, reversal of, of the tide and uh, the shift from the revolutionary phase to a counter-revolutionary phase. Um, uh, uh, and, and then, uh, as one might have expected, uh, the, the euphoria turned into gloom, uh, especially at the level of the, the, I mean, well, at the level of the participants in the region, that was one. And also the, the, from the point of view of, uh, of uh, uh, global global comment, the global perception. You had a, a lot of uh, of comments on the Arab winter, the spring turning into winter, you know, and all that. And uh, uh, in the same way that you, this uh, the, the euphoria of uh, of 2011 
was quite uh, impressionistic. One could say that uh, uh, the, the gloom of, uh, that uh, prevailed after 2013 was also actually um, uh, impression, impressionistic uh, because in both cases that was based on, on, on the lack of understanding of the depth and the real scope of this a huge revolutionary uh, uh, process that had started in uh, in December 2010 or the year 2011 when when it peaked. Um, uh, the fact is that uh, over the years, over this decade now, uh, the, the the region has been in in, in permanent uh, social and political turmoil. Um, there, there. I mean, aside from the obvious political turmoil that you you know of, the the the, the most um, I mean, most visibly in civil wars in three countries of the region: uh, Syria, uh, Yemen, and, uh, and Libya. Uh, uh, aside from that, aside from from all the the, the, the political uh, uh, upheaval that you have. Uh, there has been a, a whole series of social, of outbursts of social protest over the, this decade. Uh, uh, practically, uh, uh, that has been uh, uh, a permanent feature, uh, of course, in different countries at different times, but you always had uh, indicators of, uh, of the fact that uh, the, the region was boiling uh, uh, socially. Socially, you had a number of local uh, sometimes regional, that is regions in one country, like Tunisia, for instance, uh, had a, a number of regional protests, outbursts of anger in this or that part of the country on social issues. Um, uh, the Sudan had uh, a, a number of, uh, of, uh, of, that, uh, of, of surges in, in social protest. Uh, uh, other countries too, uh, up to Jordan in uh, 2018, which had uh, an important uh, uh, social movement that men that uh, well could not and that would be a very tough nut to crack. It, it couldn't, of course, and it, it didn't even dare um, call to the overthrow of the monarchy. But it managed, at the very least, to overthrow the the, the cabinet, the government. Uh, um, so. That these were indicators of, of an ongoing process. And then starting exactly eight years after the first uh, shockwave in uh, December 18, uh, 2018, uh, you had the beginning of a new major uprising in, in Sudan. And uh, that was followed uh, in February uh, of 2019 uh, by Algeria, uh, joining the fray, entering in its turn in uh, in uprising mode with a huge mass mobilization, um, and then uh, in October, uh, Iraq. Two weeks later, Lebanon uh, again uh, went into into uprising mode. So four more countries were added to the six initial countries of 2010. So you have now a total of 10 countries, which is practically all the key countries with a few exceptions of the region. The, all the key Arabic speaking countries uh, with a few exceptions uh, uh, um, have, have had either uh, uprisings or major uh, uh, social protests. So Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, the, the North uh, African uh, countries, and uh, the, 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 the countries that I mentioned, which are most of the uh, Asian uh, or West Asian uh, Arab countries have had such, uh, such movements. Um, and actually the, 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 the wave, the, the, the new wave, or to use, what uh, the phrase that uh, you, you, the, the, the media, some media used, the second Arab Spring uh, of 2018, of, of uh, 19, of, 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 uh, of last year, uh, was actually interrupted by COVID. The, the pandemic is what, uh, what uh, really uh, slackened down uh, the, the, the Sudanese process, although it is, it's going on, but it has been definitely uh, slowed down by by the pandemic and for a while paralyzed by the pandemic, 
the Algerian process was uh, blocked by the, the pandemic, which the, the, the military used as a pretext to, to, to ban uh, uh, demonstrations. And uh, both the, 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 the Iraq's and Lebanon's uh, movements uh, went down at least for several months due to, to the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, uh, of course, the, the pandemic is, uh, at least we hope so, is, is something temporary. Uh, it's true that it, it is playing an objectively counter-revolutionary role, if you want, in that regard. But at the same time, it is worsening the conditions of the uprising, the, the, the roots of the uprising, in the sense that the, this um, pandemic is bringing with itself a, a huge uh, uh, economy, a global economic crisis, and uh, a global economic crisis that will affect uh, the global south much more than uh, the, the rest of the world, I mean, of the, than the, the north. And within this global south, the, the, uh, this, the, MENA, the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, uh, will be uh, particularly affected. Um, uh, of course, in the discussion, <laughs> I'm not going into that, but I could have mentioned Iran, as Iran is not an Arabic speaking country, it's a different case. But there are similarities also with the case of Iran and the fact that Iran also has seen major social protests in, in recent years, especially in, uh, in the last couple of years. And that is uh, to add to the, uh, can, be, can be added to the picture. Now, the, the key thing here is that uh, what we see is a confirmation of the, 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 the fact that what started in 2011, as I tried to explain at the time, uh, was a long-term revolutionary process that was but the beginning of a long-term revolutionary process that would carry on for uh, many years, <clears throat> if not decades to come. Um, and uh, 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 like every revolutionary, long-term revolutionary process in history, it, it will inevitably go through uh, phases, uh, uh, contradictory phases of uh, of revolution and counter-revolution, uh, upsurge and uh, and uh, and backlash, and the the, the reason to 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 have seen uh, the, the the events uh, uh, through that uh, grid through that uh, prism is the understanding of the roots of the explosion, which uh, is uh, a, a result of 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 a, a condition under which the, the region is really in a structural uh, social economic crisis, uh, which is related to the social political nature of the states in the region. So you have uh, the social, the class and political nature of the state, uh, which is the key condition for uh, a, an economic uh, blockage of that part of the world, which has seen uh, the lowest rates of growth uh, per capita of Asia and Africa for uh, for for uh, uh, a few decades before the explosion, and as a result of that, the highest rates of youth unemployment in the world uh, in in the region, uh, which is the, the clearest expression of this uh, of this profound uh, structural crisis that uh, underlies the, the that is the, the underlying uh, roots of. Uh, of, uh, of this big, uh, big, uh, big upheaval. And from that, of course, uh, you get to one conclusion, uh, key conclusion, I mean, uh, which is that uh, since it is a, a structural crisis, there's no way out of it without a structural change. And that is the only safe prediction you can make is in the form of a, a either or, that is, a short of a radical change, a radical structural change in the region, uh, this crisis is going to, to, to carry on for, for very long. And the alternative is really radical social change or uh, uh, more and more tragedies <clears throat> of the kind that we have seen in, in some of the countries of the region, worst of all in, uh, in Syria, of course. And of course, I mean, I don't have, I just mentioned that this uh, leads us to, um, to understand also the, the, the crucial uh, uh, importance in, within that uh, context of, uh, of, the, the, uh, uh, of organization. 
that, which is uh, the condition without which this uh, structural change is not, won't be possible. That is what is lacking, what has been lacking in the most uh, cases has been an organ a progressive organization of the mass movement. And uh, the, the only country, I mean, the country that has been the most advanced in this regard <clears throat> is naturally the country where the process has been the most advanced and, until now, and that country is Sudan. We can uh, discuss this if you want in the discussion. I don't have more time. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Gilliam. Uh, our next speaker, Natalia Salas de Oliveira, if I'm pronouncing that right, from uh, Sao Paulo. And uh, let me just, uh, she's a young black woman, PhD student at the State University of Rio de Janeiro and a researcher at the Laboratory of Interdisciplinary Studies Critique in Capitalism. She conducts research on the capitalist and racist production of urban space. So welcome Natalia. Hello everyone, can you hear me fine? Okay, uh, Chris just sent you a copy of my reports in case I have some connectivity problems or you have some trouble to understand me to do to my uh, accent. So let's go, I have my 15 minutes. Well, my, my report, my speech today is just a report of how I see the current soci social and political situation in Brazil. Um, we are indeed experiencing one of our, our worst social, political, and economic crises, and one of the deepest crises of capitalism in the world. That said, there is no way to start this report today without talking about tomorrow's municipal election here, um, which will take place all over Brazil. Here, elections are always held on a Sunday, on a single day, and with rules being equally, equally applied across the country. Municipal elections uh, are characterized by the choice of mayors and councillors, and it is common to have several candidates from several different parties. This electoral process is important both because it precedes the vote for president by two years. Uh, sometimes this is seen as a thermometer that indicates what can be expected, expected, expected in that election future. And it is about the presentation of policies that directly affect the population. These are policies aimed at each city's problems involving primary education, urban policy, and basic health care. In these elections, a more militarized profile can be seen with a, with a set record number of police and military candidates running um, that are more than 7,200 ones. I believe that this record is also related to the profile of the current uh, federal government since Bolsonaro was elected with support and defense of this agenda. And today more than 6,000 active and reserve duty military personnel occupy civilian positions in his government. Brazil had a military dictatorship that let, lasted for about 20 years with censorship of the free press, political repression, and with torture and murder of its opponents. The process of democratization is recent, occurred in 1985, and that is why dictatorship's ghosts still haunt our present. Thus, the increase in military and police in the politics causes fear, discomfort, and concern. In this election, we have a fact not, all, not at all recent, that worries us even more, the great interference of the militia. Militias are armed to death squads made of public officers, police, military, firefighters, actives or, or retired, who dominate an activity here, for example, transport services, commerce in general, gas and water supply, security services, heatman services, uh, in areas that they believe to be in their domain, such as favelas and neighborhoods in the city. It was a reality that already had been seen uh, uh, in Rio de Janeiro for years, but this form of criminal action has branched out into other Brazilian cities. The militia has participated in politics directly or in, in indirectly, especially in local politics, and this process has intensified. 
Just to clarify, militias do not inf infiltrate and corrupt the state like the mob does, rather they are the state itself. itself. They are public officers who receive salaries and pensions from public funds and carry out criminal activity that subdue people in their own community and neighborhood. One case that had worldwide repercussions and which involved militia action is the execution of Councillor uh, Marielle Franco, who was a woman, Black, um, belonging to LGBT community and belonging to the Socialism and Freedom Party, PSOL. Uh, her uh, assassination and of her driver, Anderson Gomes, in 2018. The crime had been executed by the Office or Bureau of Crime, which is a militia made of hitmen and has been charged of, of loan sharking, land grabbing, payment of bribes to public officers and illegal construction. In Rio itself, militia and drug trafficking are present in 96 of the 163 neighborhoods in the city with militiamen controlling an even larger area than drug dealers. By 2019, they dominated 25.5% of Rio's neighborhoods, which represent 55.5% of the city's territorial surface. Such violence victimized the most the ones who live in the favelas and in the peripheral areas in the city. Beyond this structure and not recent issue, we have a new liberal policy that has been applied for some years now and implied a cut both in government in spending, which brought cuts in important public policies such as public health and education, and reforms in labor, labor laws and in social security, which made the Brazilian worker even more vulnerable. From this pandemic on, many of these workers already in complicated situations have become unemployed or are forced to work in more precarious jobs such as delivery men or Uber drivers. Still during this pandemic period, a rise in inflation of food products of daily consumption such as rice, beans, and soy oil are in place. The poorest are triple harmed by this increase since the little they receive is barely able to supply the purchase of food, payment of rent, water, and electricity bills. Thus, in addition to having a new disease, COVID-19, which is statistically kills more poor, black, and indigenous people, we have a scenario of intense social crisis in other sectors of life besides health. Finally, Brazil has also been in the spotlight because of its policy of environmental destruction. The current government encourages actions to expand agribusiness in the Pantanal and the Amazon, in addition to encouraging illegal mining in indigenous and environmental protection, uh, protected areas. These incentives occur by the dismantle of the institutes responsible for inspecting and by direct, direct policies from the Ministry of environment. The state encourages the expropriation of traditional commodities lands, which is Colombos and indigenous land, um, by agribusiness, expanding this economic sector. The environmental issue, however, is not a few facts in the country. In 2015, in the city of Mariana, Minas Gerais state, the mining dam owned by the company Samarco broke down. Uh, the company is a joint venture with the largest mining companies in the world, the Brazilian Valley, and the Anglo-Australian BHP, BHP Billiton. The torrent of mud and iron or, or tailings hit the uh, Rio do it is a river, which supplies 230 cities in the state, causing damage to its ecosystems, poisoning also the surrounding soil and vegetation. This disaster severely, severely affects the lives of riverine people and traditional communities who depend on the river to survive through fishing and cultivating the land. Just four years later, in 2019, last year, another valley company, them, breaks in Brumadinho, a city in the same state, causing the, the death of more than 259 people. Once again, the toxic mud rivers, hit rivers, uh, the land and the lives of thousands of people. After both disasters, companies elaborated compensation reconstruction projects for, this, for cities, which drag on in court or when fulfilled by plea deal 
will not actually compensate for all the social and environmental loss that people have uh, subjected to. All these crises are not mere disasters or misfortune that happen by chance in history, but they occur due to a capitalist mode of production that brought a certain way of producing both goods for human survival, which came to be understood as commodities, and social relations. It is a social constitution that manages to put itself globally through colonization, the expropriation of lands, and the way of living from the native communities in colony, and the enslavement with racial criteria. Bro both processes expand expanded the argument of value on a scale never seen before. Capitalism is characterized by a continuous process of concentration, concentration, centralization of capital. So it's, it's expansion in the world and the constant expropriation of people and workers are expected impulses throughout its development. The way we relate to nature, produce our food and relate to each other is aimed at increasing value and capitalist accumulation even if that means environmental destruction, imbalance with nature, exploitation, expropriation of workers, especially non-white ones, and dehumanization of the, those non-whites. A social relation led by capital cannot lead to, towards uh, universal human emancipation because its history and core impulses prevent that. It is not a coincidence that the layer of society that are subjected to the highest level of pressure and exploitation in the country are the workers, poor and non-white ones. They are the ones who get most sick and die from COVID-19. Uh, we are the most unemployed or with precarious job. We are who can barely afford the basic necessity, necessities of life, such as rent, rice and beans. Uh, we are uh, who suffer and die the most in favelas, communities, tribes, and quilombos by the hands of the militia, illegal gold miners, and the capitalist activities of minor extraction. All of this under the guardhouse of a militarized and authoritarian government uh, of Bolsonaro. From this per perspective, we can observe clear enhanced implication between class, uh, gender, and race, which become even more noticeable at these times of crisis, and with this come a powerful potential of mobilization. Um, so far, I talked about uh, crises that, as we can see, are many. And however, in the sea of exploitation, oppression, expropriation, we have reactions which are sometimes violent, vital, violently contained, but nevertheless insist on resurging. In the midst of the pandemic, after the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in the US, and also after the death of Agatha Felix and João Pedro, two Brazilian children, all killed by police, communities, favelas, and social organizations organized the demonstrations in the streets demanding an end to the militarization of our police and pointing out racism in our institutions. In addition to these anti-racist prote protests, in the same period we had anti-fascist demonstrations uh, opposing to the Bolsonaro government. There were demonstrations in at least 13 capitals of the country with banners of Black Lives Matter and in defense of democracy. Still in the midst of the pandemic, delivery men organized two strikes demanding better working and payment conditions, exposing uh, the exploratory process carried out by the technology companies for which they work. The traditional indigenous and quilombola communities still struggle and resist. They organize themselves against companies, against ore mining, and against various forms of expropriation. After the collapse of the dams mentioned above, uh, those mobilization intensified. The organization of the Krenak people, known as the Botocudos of River Doce Valley, was further structured post-2015 with the rupture of the dam in the city of Mariana and the death of River Doce, as you call Rio Doce, essential for the lives of these people that built itself on the banks of that river. These communities still manage to live to a large extent through a mode of production not led by capital. 
their mere existence are potent forms of resistance. When a capitalist action to extract iron or destroys the river and lands that are fundamental uh, to its existence, the Krenak people mobilize themselves by resisting and fighting against a big Brazilian company, Vale. The history of this people's struggle is long, going through land expropriations, fiscal violence, and repression in colonial times and also today. Um, this resistance is taken in order simply to survive here. And uh, in, uh, as in times of deep crisis, the most oppressed and exploited receive even more strains that the way the dire need to breathe and survive becomes even more urgent. For that reason, protests hit the streets, and uh, even a pandemic time to oppose the daily process of racist uh, ex extermination committed by our institutions and to oppose an authoritarian government. The most precarious and most vul vulnerable workers in terms of social protection and income resisted by paralyzing work. Traditional communities resist by insisting on living and reproducing non-capitalist relationships, fighting for land, uh, water, and nature, opposing themselves against big companies and mining activities. However, it is necessary to realize that Bolsonaro supporters also took the street to defend him. The big Brazilian companies encourage and support the neoliberal measures of defense uh, and defended by the current Ministry of Econ Economy. Illegal miners continue to invade indigenous land. Mining continues to occur, victimizing uh, and killing and subjugating the poor and even more the non-whites. This tension may often cause violent clashes. However, they, they may also help building uh, objective conditions for achieving new and re revolutionary social relations unlike the current ones based on the capital and centered on the oppression, exploitation, expropriation. If the history of capital, capitalism is the history of expropriation of the working class and of the non-white people, the long road to overcoming it uh, will come from this, the history of struggle and resistance of these same people. In a way, that's the path we might be building on now here in Brazil. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Natalia. And our last speaker in this session, Indindi Kanga, Indindi Kitanga from Los Angeles. Uh, Dindi is a Kenyan American educator and longtime organizer and homeless rights activist. She's the uh, founder of a progressive school in, in Los Angeles and uh, also teaches critical education studies at the graduate level. She's a published scholar in the areas of revolutionary critical pedagogy and democratic education. And she's been very active in the movement for black lives uh, in, in all the demonstrations in the last uh, several months in Los Angeles and even uh, way before that. Uh, and Dindy's talk is entitled Black Lives Matter as an Ongoing Movement. Welcome, Dindi. You might be muted. No, um, I'm having trouble hearing. You're muted, Dindi. You're muted. How's that? Good. Fantastic. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good morning, good day, or evening to everybody. I'm very much honored to be part of this. Um, panel and really glad to be in great company. Um, so yes, it is Black Lives Matter um, as an ongoing movement. And so I actually want to begin by remembering those whose lives have been stolen through police brutality and other forms of state violence, especially Black and Indigenous peoples um, who are disproportionately face state violence, um, not only in the US, but across the world. I also want to extend these sentiments to all of those uh, people whose lives have been stolen um, in the US and elsewhere due to an apt and callous neoliberal responses to the COVID crisis, including those who must live out this pandemic in prisons, refugee camps, 
immigration detention centers and other like cages. And so my brief speech is going to focus on three um, areas. I'll talk briefly about uh, Black Lives Matter as a movement and the 2020 US elections. I'll move on a little bit to um, or, um, issues of organization, care and mutual aid. And then I'll end up um, talking a little bit about black internationalism and, and what that looks like. Okay, so I'll start with a quote from Raya Dunayevskaya, um, founder of the Marxist humanist tradition, um, who says that the black dimension is crucial to the total uprooting of the existing exploitative, racist, sexist, um, society and the creation of a new truly human um, society or foundations. So the current Black Lives Matter uprising erupted on May 26 after yet another brutal murder of a black man at the hands of police, Mr. George Floyd. This movement has spread across 2000 cities and over 60 countries. And it is a broad coalition of activists whose practices are rooted in black and indigenous radical traditions, specifically those found in um, decolonial, anti-colonial, or um, what maybe used to be called third world feminisms, uh, queer liberatory feminisms, abolitionist feminisms, uh, Marxist and other socialist kind of feminist um, orientations. The movement of, uh, for black lives across the US has forced large sections of mainstream society to reckon with the legacy of racialized capital in this country. Before the George Floyd uprising, the Republican party was out registering voters this year. In May and June, we see a huge democratic party uh, voter registration spike that can be attributed to the creative organizing of uh, BIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color organizing and youth around anti-racist, anti-police and anti-capitalist politics. These politics range from social democratic reforms to more radical abolitionist demands. And while the democratic party showed symbolic sol solidarity with the movement, it hinged its organizing tactics on wooing suburban centrist whites and distancing itself from the progressive wings of its party. Post-election polls show that the masses, even those who historically live in Republican stronghold, um, which in our context, more conservative places, are amenable to ideas such as raising the minimal federal wage, implementing some kind of climate justice and a more equitable healthcare um, system. At a time when we're facing an economic crisis, a global pandemic and a historic racial justice, justice uprising, the ruling elite of the Democratic Party could not offer even basic societal reforms as part of their campaign bid against Trumpism. Their platform fell woefully short of addressing not only issues of racial climate or economic justice, but of refusing to project any kind of humanizing alternative vision. As the social media joke goes, the Democratic get out the vote slogan was nothing will fundamentally change. Conversely, black activists use the momentum from the summer uprising to put forward anti-racist policies at local, state and federal levels. And while recognizing the um, limits of electoralism and having a strong repudiation for a new neoliberal tone deaf um, policy proposals of the Democratic party, BIPOC communities organized um, themselves to vote against the authoritarian necropolitics of the Trump regime, hailing small wins in historically Republican states like Arizona, George and, uh, Georgia, and Michigan. The grassroots organizing from below gained several social reforms this election cycle. Um, I happen to live in Los Angeles and we had some of these. So these include the defunding of um, several police budgets. We have uh, agitation for uh, police unions to be expelled from <clears throat> the labor union movement in general, the defeat of pro, uh, police prosecutors, the decriminalization of drugs, um, restoring the voting rights for formerly incarcerated people, and gaining funding for program alternatives to incarceration in the criminal injustice system. Many in Black systems view, um, in Black movements, view these reforms as necessary to survive as they build power and creatively work out what a revolutionary restructuring of a society might look like. 
So on to the organization Care and Mutual Aid section. Um, many movements locate their politics in anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, abolitionist, feminist organizing. Um, so that is many words, but, but I think that they need to be said. In the last few months, we've witnessed these movements not only critique dehumanizing Democratic Party neoliberalism, but the politics of the Black bourgeoisie and the reformist projects of white social Democrats whose analysis of racial and gendered capital falls short. When asked about the unique ways BLM, Black Lives Matter movements are organizing, Black feminist scholar Kathy Cohen acknowledges the horizontal democratic leadership models of the current movements that we're seeing. So she says that many of the young leaders in the Black Lives Matter movement recognize that the male charismatic leader or the singular charismatic leader is not the form of leadership that they adhere to or they, they are going to put forth. In fact, many of these um, new organizations are led by young black women who identify as queer and who promote the idea as Barbara Ransbury says, that far from this movement being led by one person or having no leaders, it is a leaderful movement with cis and trans women taking positions of power. So the organizations that are parts of a network of groups working under the broad framework of Black Lives Matter look different and structure their leadership differently than organizations significant to the civil rights movement, in part because of feminist teaching and scholarship um, and the fact that, that the young activists that we're seeing are participating in those and, and thinking and learning about those in, um, in their own organizing spaces and in higher education. Um, beyond organizing and horizontal democratic collectives or making abolitionist demands, Black Lives Matter and other related movements are engaging in mutual aid work and creating large networks of care to address the economic, political and healthcare crises we find ourselves in. So mutual aid addresses community survival needs, um, but it also serves another purpose. That is to undermine the reification of human relations under capital. Mutual aid care work in particular necessarily re reveals how reproductive labor, mostly done by working class women of color across the world, sustains capitalism. And these become even more obvious when you have movements that are led by um, black, black indigenous um, and poor women. As the capitalist mode of production reproduces the capitalist worker relation and capital subsumes all aspects of our lives, the very structures it relies on to reproduce itself, you know, such as the patriarchal nuclear family and other institutions of care begin to degrade. This for Marx presents an opening, if you will, for new forms of family and caretaking institution that are not based in exploitative um, social relations to emerge. So beyond addressing immediate needs, the mutual work um, we are witnessing, at least for me, is also solidarity work that hinges upon the recognition of our deep interconnectedness and suggests ways of relating to one another that might begin to dissolve the transactional attitudes inculcated by capitalism itself. Um, so on to this notion of internationalism and maybe what this can look like. As a global movement, Black Lives Matter is building on the history of Black radical internationalism. The Black radical organizing we're seeing today um, maintains a dialectical relationship between local level praxis and international liberation making or uh, what Paul Ortiz calls emancipatory internationalism. And so Ortiz traces the history of this framework. And he says that in emancipatory internationalism had been born in the first stormy years of the Republic, US Republic, when African-Americans and their allies recognized that slavery, racial capitalism and imperialism were fatally intertwined. Now, even as they are embroiled in struggles for land, the right to vote and the and uh, protection from KKK terrorism. African-Americans insisted that their emancipation was incomplete as long as oppression existed elsewhere." Um, end quote. 
And we cannot forget the internationalism of the first abolitionist movement of the early 19th century. Many black abolitionists understood that the work of the anti-slavery movement would not be over or was not over after Emancipation Proclamation. Instead, they acknowledged that there would be no liberation without a radical restructuring of society that addressed all global struggles to white supremacist imperialism, uh, colonization, and racialized capital. Um, in, in the late 1800s, we see thousands of Black revolutionaries um, join Cuba in, in um, solidarity, urging the US government to support the independence of Cuba. We see a strong condemnation of European states in their scramble for Africa by Black radicals, US Black radicals during that same time. Later in the 20th century, we see uh, Black revolutions again reject the imperialist and colonial, colonial practices of the US in the Philippines and with issues like things like the annexation of Guam and the export of US militarism across the globe. Uh, across the globe. And from the 60s and on, we witnessed new Black internationalist solidarities emerge alongside the anti-colonial movements of um, Africa, places in Asia, the anti-apartheid movement, the uh, fight against US imperial actions across Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And um, there's always this general resistance to the never expanding, uh, the never ending expansion of the US military industrial complex to this day. And while black radical internationalisms are not new, current movements are drawing on frameworks from the early abolitionist movements, along with new theoretical insights articulated by prison um, um, abolitionist scholar activists of the 90s and early 2000s. And so I'm talking about people like um, uh, Ruth um, um, Wilmore and others. And these movements are developing their own creative organizing practices based on knowledge co-produced and shared across BIPOC and feminist collectives who've been doing this work that we're seeing now for the past three decades. Here I want to highlight the NSAR, the NSARS movement in Nigeria whose original purpose, according to its leaders, um, and they call themselves the Feminist Coalition, was to, quote, champion equality for women in Nigerian society with a core focus on education, financial freedom, and representation in public office. They say, we have a vision for Nigeria where equality for all people is a reality in our laws and our everyday lives. So this movement, while not a revolutionary in all of its aims, has clearly not only been just against state violence, but also cis um, heteropatriarchy and neoliberal capitalism. The young people leading this movement know and understand the police brutality inflicted by SARS, which is the special anti-robbery squad, disproportionately affects youth, sex workers, um, those who work in an informal e um, economy, women and queer people. And those, and, and those are the people who are most vulnerable to state surveillance, harassment and imprisonment in Nigeria. And we're, we are witnessing the SARS movement shift um, in a matter of, of very few weeks from one interested in reforms. Um, for example, in one of their early understandings of this, they wanted police officers to be paid more so that they would be less likely to be corrupt. They've since moved on to that demand to, um, to do something else. So, um, so they've been interested in reforms of a, of a corrupt state to one that is now liberating food from government storehouses for the people, uh, fighting for the full humanity of queer folks in a qu country where being LGBTQ is mostly illegal, uh, self-determination for indigenous uh, folks and religious minorities. And they're no longer asking for police officers to be better paid. They're questioning the very foundations of, of society itself. In a recent piece of Farian El-Khattab, 
ask, what is holding back the formation of a global prison abolitionist movement to fight COVID-19 and capitalism? Capitalism. Their analysis of carceral state systems extends to the plight of the world's 70 million displaced refugee population and the oft forgotten prison populations of states like China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, Iran, um, India, and Mexico. Similarly to the US prison industrial complex, these countries disproportionately surveil police and imprison their dispossessed racialized ethnic and religious minorities. And while fewer women are incarcerated globally, the prison of women and non-gender conforming people is growing at a much faster rate than that of um, the imprisonment of men. From their perspective, a global prison abolitionist movement should fully extend its anti-imperialist analysis to non-Western authoritarian states that are oppressing the national minorities within their borders um, criminalize, and criminalizing their female, queer, non-gender conforming populations. As they note, the global left has sometimes been reluctant to criticize authoritarian non-Western leaders that claim to be against US imperialism. The international abolitionist theory, at, at least for me or, or how I see it, um, should and must continue to engage fully with the geography of global carceral capital, which is or which are the, con the, contradiction of cap the contradictions of capitalism that lead to more and more people being in some cage or other. The international abolitionist movements need to anticipate and organize effectively against new technologies that will be used to further surveil population under the guise of security um, ensuing financial precarity among the global massing, masses that will expand the indebted class and result in further criminalize, criminalization of poor people, state repression of organizers from authoritarian governments, the crisis of climate breakdown and the resulting criminalization of climate refugees, the ongoing social management of non-white people through immigration policy, the increased private, privatization of large sectors of the carceral state. And I just named a handful. Um, so I do want to conclude by exploring two concepts, the concept of black masses and, as vanguard and a return to Marx's concept of revolution and permanence. And uh, black masses as vanguard as articulated by um, Raya Dunevskaya, um, is uh, I recently encountered a very clear and accessible explanation of this by one of our IMHO members, um, Jonas Gran, which I'll read out. And he says, the idea of black masses of vanguard should not be completed with the idea of a vanguard party that leads and directs the masses. What Dunevskaya meant with vanguard in this sense really goes back to Marx and his concept of alienation. As an oppressed group, the black, people are alienated and in fact, deeply alienated. The term alienation used by Hegel when he described a situation of self estrangement. Marx famously picked it up and used it as a key concept in his writings. The opposite of alienation for both Marx and Hegel is then self activity. Emancipation from alienation is therefore self activity. It goes without saying that self activity is something no one else can do for you just because it is self-activity. And when the black masses then act as vanguard, they're not leading anyone else, but instead acting as an inspirational force that is showing what is possible. And by doing that, make others want to liberate themselves from their self-estrangement as well. So I thought that was a useful um, analogy. And so always working um, from Marxist, um, or rather not analogy, explanation. Always working from Marx's concept of revolution and permanence, we should explore the question um, that, that uh, Dunevskaya and often I'm sure many of us think about, what happens the day after revolution? This question as I see it requires the day to embody the past, the here and now and the future. It is a question that suggests that the task is not simply overcoming racialized or gendered capital, 
but that the overcoming cannot happen without working out what the vision of a new emancipated, emancipated unalienated society might look like. To address the question of what happens the day after the revolution, who better to look to than those who have historically at every turn rejected dehumanization and whose demands have never been quenched with bourgeois recognitions or reforms. These BIPOC and queer and youth revolutionaries are added again. They also envision that day after revolution, a day not built only on robust radical traditions or principled hope, but also on their and our present day work. To become part of this important project, we can learn more, uh, we can learn from these practices from below and allow these new insights to guide our theorizing. We must also engage with philosophies of liberation that have the potential to inform practice. And so I want to end with a quote from a young man I met um, last week from North Carolina, who's a black organizer. Uh, his name is Terrence Hawkins, and he describes himself as an organizer and a public theologian. And so um, when asked to reflect on the black movement work that we've seen in the past couple of days, uh, months, he said, there exists a people kissed by the sun who in every generation have kept the smoldering wicks of democratic possibilities from being snuffed out. Their vision is bigger than the nation state. Their tradition is a critique of the very foundation on which it rests on. Their practice does not call into being a more perfect union under imperialism. Rather, it abolishes and reconstructs. It births new worlds rooted in borderless love, compassion, justice, mutuality, and love. And best believe its chief archi architects and practitioners are Black women. Thank you. Thank you, Dindi. Uh, we're going to, uh, rather than have a break, since we're running a bit late, let's just go straight into the discussion. I just want to emphasize that uh, the IMHO, when we're sponsoring this meeting, is a radical learning space where we develop ideas dialectically. We aim to center voices of revolution, including women, Black people, Latinx people, Indigenous people, LGBTQ youth workers, and other oppressed and exploited groups. So here are community agreements. One mic, one voice. Only uh, one person should speak at a time. We're going to take a stack for speaking. So go on to the, the chat and put you just write your name and stack if, if you want to uh, to speak. Uh, no one knows everything together. We know, know a lot. This means we all get to practice being curious and humble because we have something to learn from everyone in the room. Asking questions, listening, and speaking are equally valuable. Three, be mindful of each other's personhoods. We have different backgrounds, cultures, and experiences, but we also come together as people. Please engage with each other in good faith and avoid making assumptions. While our space is conducted in English, be mindful that this dominant language is not how many people comfortably communicate. Four, please ask yourself, why am I talking? Consider whether or not you want what you want to say has already been said, whether what you want to say is on topic or whether there's a better time and place to say it. And uh, five, uh, if, uh, if there are any issues, you can private message one of the facilitators and that's me and a Christian up in the up, upper left. Uh, and, and also Chris uh, from Los Angeles, if you know him. Uh, and we'll help you. So put your name on stack if you want to speak. I think what we'll do is take a number of, and they, people have three minutes maximum each. Uh, and let's take a number of these uh, rather than a direct answer from speakers, but feel free to pose your question directly to a the speaker. Then at the, as we approach uh, the end of this session, we'll ask, ask each speaker to, uh, to respond to whatever questions that they wish to, uh, and issues they wish to respond to. So let's go ahead, uh, who would like, I don't see anyone on stack first. Who would, who would like to go first? If I may snag in a very quick question, Kevin, do you yeah. want me to keep time of our yeah, folks on stack or? Oh, sure. You're, you're better and more aggressive than I am, so you can keep time. All right, thank you. <laughs> Um, so who would like to speak? We're just so overwhelmed by what we've heard, we have nothing to add. I mean, in a positive sense. Uh, 
I put myself a stack, so. Should I recognize myself, Kevin, or would you ever be so kind? Go ahead. Uh, All right. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so my question is for Gilbert in particular, and my apologies if you already mentioned this a bit, but what do you think are the prospects for a resurgence of labor movements, uh, anti-capitalist movements, or even social democratic movements in the Swana countries? Thank you. Okay, and then uh, we have next on stack Andres. And, and, and say where you're from if you wish to when, when you speak. Identify yourself in some way. Andres. Okay, Andres might be offline for them. We'll come back to him. Uh, Ravi Mahotra, go ahead. Or are these people, are we unmuting them? Wait a minute. Could Andres be trying to speak and is he muting? Now I'm unmuting. Oh, yeah. oh, he's free, yeah. Okay, Andres. Sorry, sorry Ravi, we'll come back to you. Andres, go ahead. I'm, uh, I'm in the, um, the village of Riverside, California, just outside of Los Angeles. Um, and I'm sorry that I, I came in uh, a little late, but I, Dindy's talk provoked some thoughts uh, about after the revolution. And if I could maybe present an analogy to, to explain my question. In, in my household, as when I was growing up, my father was the sole breadwinner. Uh, it was a patriarchy. Uh, my mother had a lot to say about the decision-making, but at the end of the day, he called the shots. And we all understood this. Um, I think that the seat of his power ultimately, I mean, it was patriarchal, patriarchal power, but it was economic. It was the fact that he, I'm sorry, uh, can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. It was the fact that he could um, cut off our supply line if he chose to. <laughs> so I think I learned very early on that the material conditions and the person who holds the, um, the cash is the ultimate owner of this situation. So I think that um, in a, re a successful revolution, the, the people who have been the, uh, the subordinate class, the working class, the majority have to take over the economy. If, if we're materialist, I think Marxist was not a crude materialist, but I think he saw the economy as the driving force for, for all other factors in human life. We have to take charge of how things are, are, are ordered, how things are run. My understanding right now is that there are these industries like um, oil extraction, um, gas, um, the, 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 high, the high tech technology. I actually don't feel like I, I, if I was ever at the gates of the palace, Pardon me, Andres, know, one minute left, brother. Thank you. I wouldn't know what to do personally, and I don't know if our movements would know what to do. Um, we would be sort of in the, in the event of a collapse of the system, which is maybe one scenario, maybe a, the next pandemic will do it because this won't be the end of the pandemics. Uh, we, we're we're uh, encroaching on... Uh, other species habitats to the point where the, the diseases are, I think it's called zoogenic or zoonotic. What will we do when the vaults are opened? How will we um, step up to it? I guess that's the question that always comes to mind. Thank you. Okay, let's try to get Ravi on. 
Rabbi Mahotra. Can people hear me now? Yes. So I, uh, I'm a disability rights advocate, academic in Canada. My question is, is quite short and it's for uh, Gilbert. Uh, and my, my question is simply, in, I enjoyed your presentation a great deal and I simply wanted to ask, when you do your analysis, and I've read some of your work previously, do you see class politics and class revolt in, uh, in, in the Turkish state, of which there's been a whole lot of discussion, you know, in the global media, do you see the crises in Turkey as part of the same process of the, as the Arab Spring, or do you see that as a separate dynamic when you speak of MENA? So it's, it's a relatively straightforward question. That's my question. Okay, uh, I believe that uh, Lilia is next. <clears throat> Unmute yourself, Lilia. Hi, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to sort of respond, I guess, to, um, to Andres' comment. <laughs> um, and uh, not in, you know, um, uh, he knows I love him. So, um, uh, but uh, I guess I, uh, my thought as a woman is that it's a little bit more complex than um, the material conditions, right? Than cash and money. Um, and certainly I think, um, you know, the material conditions really do uh, uh, highly influence, right? Uh, power relations uh, within the family. Um, and certainly, you know, over time and over history, right, um, you know, create uh, uh, conditions where uh, women, you know, are, are and society really, you know, um, uh, you know, live, our, live their lives in ways that women remain subordinate. Um, but I think that this happens in very, um, like it, it's so complex that people don't even realize where it's coming from. So that even when women uh, nowadays, right? And in presumably in the US where you find people will say, well, you know, like, you know, sexism has changed and it doesn't really happen anymore. And women are making more money than men, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I, I, I think in the end, you still see, you know, there's a, there's, um, in some ways there's a parallel to racism, right? That it, it is a, a, a structure in and of itself um, that has lasted over, you know, um, uh, you know, centuries and, you know, been highly uh, 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 increased through accumulation. Of course, um, the material again is an important aspect of that. But I think as we think um, beyond like, you know, what happens next, right, after the revolution or whatever. Um, I do think that um, gender relations, race relations, all of these are not something that's gonna cease when the revolution happens, right? Like those are things that are gonna have to be worked on and they're gonna have to be worked on um, in, in conjunction Pardon with me, Lillian, any you struggle. Have left. Okay, in conjunction with any struggle against class. I mean, I think in, in some ways, one of the, I mean, uh, there are multiple issues in, in place when we think about, you know, how, um, you know, uh, socialist revolutions have uh, failed, right? But I do think that one aspect of that is, you know, how do you create a system of, you know, uh, that challenges human hierarchies, which basically in, in, in a very real way is what capitalism is, right? How do you do that, you know, in society and then come home and still have a relationship of domination within the family every day. Like that doesn't, you know, like, so those things have to be um, uh, challenged in every context uh, and it's gonna take a long time to do, but they have to be continuously um, challenged and they become invisible to those who, who are in positions of domination, right? So it is up to those who are um, in positions that are subordinate to, you know, we, we have to listen to those because they are the ones that kind of know like when they experience it and it becomes difficult for the dominant, you know, it's invisible to them, I think, in many ways. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Next is uh, Nick. 
Nick, unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's just a very general question. It's very sort of discouraging that the right are in the ascendancy, especially after the crisis moment of 2008. And I just wondered what the panel thought was the fundamental reason behind that. And I've kind of like got an idea it's to do with globalization and that once capital was free to go around the world, that destroyed um, national working class trade unions. And it's to do, it, it, se it seems that any, any attempt by the working class to get any power um, is just completely undermined by capital going elsewhere. I, I, I just wondered if people had any thoughts about that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, and our next uh, person on the stack is Mansoor. No one else is on stack, so we'll have room for maybe one, two, more, one, maybe one more people after Mansoor. Go ahead, Mansoor. Unmute yourself. Mansoor? Okay, yeah, I, I have uh, basically like a question for Gilbert uh, relating to Middle East and also kind of comment about um, I don't know if that's a real phenomena or something, but you know, I wanted to kind of somebody to speak about this um, impoverization of the the working class and masses, and 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 the consequence of that is that it seemed we have this phenomena of poor that you know the poor that and some of them were Latino and Blacks that voted for Trump. And as I see some parallel in Iran as well, that um, that you you see people get so impoverished uh, that they will really do anything essentially to get by, you know. And like in Iran, the the Trump's sanction basically, you know, strengthened the Iranian regime, whether he wanted to do that or not, but quite weakened the you know the uh, the poor people the working class and to a large degree the middle class they've impoverished the middle class and these guys are all the people are just basically have to worry about making ends meet and you know they don't enter the political arena and um as much as they should because you know so that's that to me that's the phenomena of um, one thing in in U.S. that I don't know I don't have the statistics. Maybe Kevin can speak about that. But there seem to be some some sections of the poor that they did vote for Trump. The other thing that I have a question for Gilbert is you know I, I think he spoke about Middle East situation. Um, what what do you, Gilbert? What do you think the what is it the key to the Middle East politics that would really that they would liberate the region that would really what what is how how does a log jam of reaction is going to get on, on on you know unplugged if you will you know uh, what do you think the key driver what is it that you know as marxist humanists and revolutionists should uh, strive for that's it uh, anybody else want the floor uh, if not, I have two questions. Three, I have three. one question. Yeah, let me let me ask my really brief one. Uh, Natalia, uh, I wondered if uh, you could reflect a little more on the similarities and differences in the struggle around race and class in Brazil versus the United States. And Zahur, I wondered you, you presented it wasn't a very uh, happy picture you presented of India. And the subcontinent, I wonder if you could talk about possibilities of resistance. A lot of people have mentioned this Shaheen Bagh movement last winter. I know this situation, especially after the election in Bihar is very difficult, but uh, if you could just say a few words on that, I think that might be good. Uh, okay, uh, was that Ali Reza? You wanted to? Go ahead, unmute yourself though. Yeah, and uh, I had a question, especially for Gilbert. Uh, first of all, thank you for from uh, all the speaker. Uh, 
in my view, the, the, in Middle East, uh, while there is a lot of uh, movement, a lot of demonstration, a lot of uprising, uh, don't you think uh, they took page of uh, what uh, Reagan brought it to the get rid of union and we can control it. And somehow, don't you think in the Middle East, one of the problem right now is a lack of uh, people mobilized, but lack of really organization among people. Uh, we could see in the, the Egypt, that something happened and there's really uh, movement went forward. Then they had to really suppress this. Uh, what do you think is one of the main reason for Gilister that they cannot be successful right now because of lack of organization and organization among the people? And the same thing we see in different places. We see the same thing in the Middle East. I'd like to know if you, what you think. Okay, thank you, uh, Ali. So let's go over to the speakers to respond. Uh, why don't we just take them in the order that they spoke? Don't go more than three minutes or three or four minutes. Uh, so, uh, Zahur, uh, go ahead if you have anything to respond to. Not only direct, yeah. but anything you know you wish to respond. Oh uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Uh, when this citizenship amendment bill was enacted in 2019, so uh, for that people, uh, I mean, they resisted against the move because this was uh, in this was discriminatory in nature. Okay, and what the bill did, it marginalizes only one section of people that is Muslims. So people came out of from their homes and started. Protests against the move. Not only, I mean, uh, not uh, not only uh, not only people did movement against the citizenship amendment bill, but farmers also started a movement. So in this part of the world, I mean, people they they are aware. Okay, uh, they they are conscious about the fascist regime. I mean, what what they are doing. I mean. They do, uh, they do hell kind of things, and in Kashmir particularly, uh, you might heard or you people came across through newspapers that uh, after 2019 development, what they did, they surveilled the whole people. Uh, I mean, they incarcerated uh, all the people around seven months, but still. Uh, people protested, uh, and there is a movement going on uh, against the fascist regime. And still, there are thousands of people they are in jail. Oh, and one more thing: young people. If we if we if we see the movement before 1990s, uh, elder people uh, they were they were uh, they were fighting against the operation but after 2008 young people particularly at the age of 10 to 20 or 10 to uh, 25 they came aware they, they they are they are conscious uh about this uh, suppression or operation and they i mean in, in every day they i mean they show the fightness against against this fascist uh, tendencies uh, uh, and the fight will go on. I mean, if we will, if we will see uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, this this problem. Uh, it was started not only nineteen forty seven or nineteen thirty. It was started in eighteen eighteen sixties uh, when farmers and peasant class they have started a movement against that again again against the dogras against this. Uh, Against this, um, uh, against the bureaucracies who exploited them. But unfortunately, after 1930s or 
after 1970s uh, the farmers the peasant movement have been hijacked uh, by some people i mean uh, uh, you people you people you people you people might know about this huriyat they have hijacked that, that the movement but uh, now uh, if you will see in the kashmir uh, there are there are uh, i mean inside or there are people i mean who organizing debates and discussions and who who, who organizing protest against uh, the exploitation of farmers uh, i mean all those suppressive policies thank you uh, gilbear right uh, thank you kevin and thank you for for those who who uh, put questions to me um well we have very little time so i'll be very 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 brief um i start with the the differences between turkey iran and the uh, uh, arabic uh, speaking uh, countries uh, of uh, of the region um i mentioned the the structural crisis and i explained that is uh, that manifestation of this crisis with a with a, a I mean, lack of development or very slow rates of development, and therefore a number of uh, consequences, uh, most prominent of which is uh, the, the, the very high rate of youth uh, unemployment. Uh, right now, the, the 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 core issue here is that uh, uh, you have a kind of state system and uh, political, social, political conditions in the region that are not conducive to. Uh, long-term private uh, uh, investment of a of a kind that uh, that would benefit uh, the economic development of a country, um, and that's where the neoliberal recipes uh, bear a major uh, responsibility in producing the kind of social situation that exploded in 2011. Now, if you take Turkey, Turkey is a completely different case. Actually, Turkey is one of the few countries where neoliberalism can point to some success, because Turkey in the 90s and the first decade of uh, this century has gone through uh, uh, quite uh, rapid uh, development. And uh, indeed, I mean, anyone familiar with Turkey. would have seen that uh, throughout these two two decades now of course now it, it's uh, i mean the, the situation is changing but but uh, the the conditions in turkey are quite different the social economic conditions are quite different from what you have uh, in the arabic speaking countries iran is closer as i mentioned uh, iran is closer but it's a very specific case and the role of the state in iran uh, i mean the nature of the state is very different from anything you have in the other countries uh, i mean the arabic speaking countries and the, the 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 conditions are different it's true that the sanctions and all that uh, uh, are an important factor in in what is uh, happening in in uh, in uh, <coughs> fueling the discontent that's undeniable i, I believe but uh, of course there's also the nature of the system the uh, uh, also the fact that uh, i mean to a certain degree there are limits to to what private capitalism can achieve uh, what kind of the nature of private capitalism under conditions like those of iran uh, bearing in mind that the state as i said is different and can play a different role anyhow the the, the key difference is the the one of the nature of the the regime this is an ideological state this is the only theocracy in the world actually and uh, uh, it's it uses the oil rent to 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 maintain a social constituency uh, which is also mobilized ideologically and that makes it uh, an even more difficult case uh, than i mean for change for radical change than uh, in the uh, mina in the middle east and north africa country the arabic speaking ones um the now number of questions went around the, the same issue which is the the one i i ended <clears throat> with but i couldn't uh, develop and here also i can develop it the issue of organization but let just yes if i may you have one minute left right exactly that's what i was going to to to, to do that is uh, very briefly uh, put the the, the the question here as one where 
you have a potential, an important potential, uh, much more important than people uh, might believe seeing from uh, abroad, uh, a progressive potential in the, in the region. Uh, in all these uprisings, there have been uh, a huge number of, of uh, especially young people, and you, there are still a huge number of young people who adhere to uh, progressive ideas, progressive values, and might be organized, maybe organized around, can be organized around uh, a progressive program. The problem is one of organization, and that's where I was saying that that, that would be the, the crucial issue. And uh, uh, now this is a cumulative process. Uh, it started in 2011. As I said, it's a long term. It's, it will probably go for decades. And uh, we'll, we'll have to see at what rhythm the, 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 we'll, we'll witness the, the buildup of something. But uh, it, it's already important that we have a more advanced example in the case of, uh, of Sudan, as I mentioned, where uh, you have a real left-wing uh, grassroots organization. Uh, you have uh, actually a dual structure. One is a union-like uh, uh, representation of the movement, which is the Sudanese Professional Association. Another is a grassroots, especially young uh, youth uh, network of, uh, at the level of, of, uh, of uh, the neighborhoods and all that, which, which is absolutely impressive. We're speaking of very high numbers in the tens of thousands of people. Of Army people. Gilbert, last couple of right. thoughts, if possible. That's finished. We got, a, we got a lot of questions. Yes, thank you. Oh, all right. Uh, so next, who's next here, Natalia? Yes, um, I'll, I'll try to be, uh, to talk faster about it. Uh, Difference and similarities between uh, the struggles in Brazil and US concerning uh, race and, and class. Well, um, Brazil, we have uh, more than 50% of the population here declared as black. Uh, it's a lot of people, but we have a long history of uh, dividing black people. Um, sometimes, uh, Black people who has a lighter color of skin due to mixed race uh, marriage, uh, sometimes these people are not seen by the society as black. They they are seen as white. So it's uh, it's a way of of historically uh, dividing the movement and dividing the the self uh, um, recognition as as black. So it's a, a, a difficulty here. I think in the US, uh, it appears to me it has more uh, unified in the sense, uh, uh, the movement is more unified. And um, here I see when, there are, when we have a moment of deep crisis or if, you, uh, if the person, if, if one uh, it stands on the on a position of poor, being poor and being black, for example, in favelas or quilombos, uh, the, the struggle uh, can be more um, effective and the person recognizes himself or herself as black and poor, and it has more uh, power of mobilization. But uh, when uh, we have, you know, it, it is uh, a recent thing that's going on, but uh, few black people uh, are having more income and better jobs. And it is, uh, I think that's quite similar in the US. Uh, sometimes it um, uh, divides the, the black move, uh, move, movement for rec recognition and um, better uh, treatment for police and etc. I think, uh, we, I think we are more. We have more similarities in uh, with the U.S. than differences. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's one thing. And a thing that is um, being uh, said here, and it, it's also an interesting thing that's going on here too. Uh, you said about uh, black people and Latins uh, voting for Trump. 
And here also we have, you know, black people and poor people voting for uh, right, uh, right wing uh, politicians. It is something that really uh, urges uh, more, more um, studies, <laughs> I may say. But I think um, voters are pretty pragmatical. Here in Brazil, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro's popularity had a boost do uh during the pandemic Natalia, if i may you have one minute left yeah uh due to an financial aid that the government uh, concede uh, for poor people so i think uh people vote uh in what appear to be uh what, what is uh directly doing some good for them and even if that happens just in the speech of the that that um, president. What happened here in Brazil? But um, yeah, that's it. I had I had a lot more to to say, but I, I don't have time. Thank you. Yeah, Cindy, you want to respond? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I'll I'll try and respond very quickly. Um, I do have a question that I know we can answer in a different place for uh, Gilbert. I'm, I'm really curious when it comes to the Gulf monarchies, if you see any kind of revolutionary potential there. And the question I ask that is because I, I have many African comrades and people across North Africa who work in those contexts, they're not part of, um, they make up that 90% immigrant labor that you discussed. And I'm wondering if what organization and revolutionary politics looks like there. Um, I think maybe I'll try and answer, uh, address one of the questions that I see here in the chat. And there's this, um, it's a question about how, or maybe, maybe it's a question about how Black Lives Matter as a movement can further mobilize. Um, and, and I think what the person here is asking um, they're talking about, is there a way for Marxists to participate in BLM movements and activities without tailing to a preoccupation with disproportionate killings? And so I, I, I think what I'm gonna start with saying is um, Black Lives Matter as a movement and, and all the Black Lives um, movements that we're seeing, are, I think for me are teasing out something that's really interesting. This, this thing between the sensational and the mundane and some kind of dialectical relationship with that. And by saying that, you know, George Floyd is a human being whose life ended in this kind of very awful way and becomes a very public figure and is very sensational. And there's a, a complete movement that has to do with that. But it's not about a George Floyd. It's 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 about the mundane everyday life of Black Indigenous people, and I, I, and also just full on segments of the working class, white people. Everybody experiences state violence. Um, what I'm a little bit more um, kind of reluctant to get into is this idea that our movements should do something, our black movements need to do something to nicely fold in to these bigger movements. I think to say, just stop killing us is a very reasonable demand and is a very radical demand and that should be fine. And I think it actually should be the other way around that the people who are doing the things and practicing the things, my question should be, you all should come in and figure out like how we're trying to figure out, you know, how we are resisting and rejecting dehumanization. And I don't think that that needs to do with catering to um, disenfranchised white working class. Um, because I, I, but because I consider racialized capitalism to be a project that everyone across the left should consider um, to be very serious and something that we should all um, think about. Um, I do think that you do point out a couple of things that I hopefully tried to tease out that this expansion of a carceral state 
Yes, Jindy, sure. if I may, you have one minute left. Okay, I can do this. Yes, um, that it's going to to go ahead. Of of course, poor people are disproportionately affected by incarceration and police brutality and all of these things. I just happen to talk about a segment of society that has been creatively and actively working it out um, for a very long time. And so our movements, as far as I can, as far as I understand it, Black Lives Matter is a movement is a very human project. And so I would encourage people to like get on board as opposed to for the rest of us to um, de-emphasize the disproportionate killings of black people. Dindy, last couple of thoughts that. if possible. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, even though we're one or two minutes over, if Bill Bear wants to respond briefly to this thing about the immigration in the Gulf and revolution here. You can respond. We're not hearing you. Oh, sorry, Gilbert. If you want to respond briefly to uh, immigration in the Gulf and monarchies and how that affects possibilities for uprisings there, that Dindi was just asking you. If you want to respond to that briefly, go ahead. But if not, it's fine too. I mean, I can very briefly say that uh, yeah. I mean, you have a case of racial capitalism there, which is. Uh, uh, one where it's not a white, non-white dichotomy, but a different one uh, with the locals. And uh, um, it's uh, such an extreme case that it's uh, quite uh, difficult to envisage any, I mean, for, for the extreme cases like Qatar, like the United Arab Emirates to, to envisage any, any kind of development of, uh, of a revolutionary movement because uh, these are society is under very tight control and uh, any kind of protest leads to, to you being deported. That's very easy. I mean, they just, uh, they don't even keep you there. So um, no, uh, but these are small, tiny uh, states. And the key point is uh, that the Gulf monarchies are very much depending on the big brother among them, which is the Saudi kingdom. And there you have a real population. And that's where if you will, if I mean, change in the, for that part of the world uh, will have to start to be effective. Uh, you had Bahrain, for instance, Oman had movements, but uh, they were deterred. Like Bahraini one, you had intervention of Gulf countries led by the Saudis. So as long as the big brother is there, you won't have any any change. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. It was a brilliant session, in my opinion. And uh, in 25 minutes, exactly, we're going to resume uh, from theory to practice. This one was from practice to theory, although I didn't say that. Uh, and we have a number of our very good speakers. So I'll please, I hope everyone stays and then more people join us. So now's our break and I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Uh, my name is Jonas Gran. I'm based in Malmö in South Sweden. And the, my clock is now, uh, just a, a few minutes past here, so we'll start. Um, I'm also a member of the International Marxist Humanist Organization, and I think most of you who are here now participated in this earlier session we had, but there are some new faces, I think, also. And just for, for, for those of you who are new, I'll, I'll say that what you just zoomed into is a mini conference organized, sponsored by the International Marxist Humanist Organization. And if you don't know what the International Marxist Humanist Organization is, I can just say that the IMHO is an organization that aims to develop and project a viable vision of an alternative to capitalism, a new human society that can give direction to, the day, to today's freedom struggles. And that's part of what the underlying purpose for this mini conference is. Uh, we just had a session with four great speakers who talked on the topic of uh, uh, from practice to theory. And we'll now have a session with four another great speakers that will talk on the topic from theory to practice. Each speaker will get 15 minutes, minutes each, and then we'll have uh, at least an hour for discussion afterwards. We have a few community ag agreements on how to, how to behave in the discussion, but I'm not, Kevin read those 
during the formal session. I'm not going to read them out again. I'll, I'll try to post them in the chat here uh, so you can read them. But everyone behaved very, very fine during the last uh, discussion. So. Uh, the, four, uh, the first speaker out for, for this panel will be Lilia D. Monzo. Lilia is in Los Angeles and she is the author of the book A Revolutionary Subject, Pedagogy of Women of Color and Indigeneity. She teaches in the field of education and is, and is co-editor of the Paolo Freire Democratic Project at Chapman University. Uh, and in that project, she uses Marxist humanist and decolonial approaches to confront capitalism and imperialism and racism and the hyper exploitation of women of color while envisioning a socialist alternative. And uh, Lilia will be speaking on black, indigenous and other women of color as force and reason. So Lilia, uh, you have 15 minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's still morning, yes, it's still morning here, at least in, the, in LA. Okay, so I'm gonna speak on the importance of black, indigenous and other women of color to revolutionary transformation, especially as they have become increasingly visible and influential in some of the most important revolutionary movements today and are reconceptualizing movement building and organizational leadership and prefiguring a more human world. And Dindi talked a little bit about that. So um, there's gonna be a little overlap here, but I, I think we say things in different ways. So sometimes that's good. Um, the importance of movement building cannot be overstated. After the massive protests led by Black Lives Matter, which by most accounts were multiracial, we still had an expected to be over 70 million people voting for Trump and his white supremacists misogynist, anti-LGBTQIA, anti-Muslim, anti-science, and overall anti-human campaign. While the anti-Trump campaign did win, this was certainly not a win for the left nor for black lives. While it's wonderful to see a black and Indi an Indian woman take the vice presidency, her record does not represent the interest of working class black and brown communities. Um, and the Biden neoliberal administration will undoubtedly move further to the right to secure a second term. And the Republican Trump base will be looking to put further um, uh, or another fascist in the White House in the next four years. As the radical left, we need to be much smarter, more organized, more committed, more creative than we have in the past. And we need to work with and learn from the people who are most in need of and willing to risk it all for change. Racism, especially, is a complicated construct that has been massively successful at dividing peoples whose interests ought to be aligned. Still, when issues hit home, people stand up. A noteworthy result of this election, and I think uh, Kevin mentioned it a little bit earlier, is that is the significant hike in Latinx voters with a 64% turnout of eligible voters um, compared to um, their typical 50% turnout in the past years. Um, today, our best bet at organizing may be around racism, especially in the United States, where race divisions run so deep and class and race are so aligned that they attempt to focus, that any attempt to focus on class is often immediately perceived, in many cases correctly so, as a form of class reductionism that prioritizes white interests. But to rally around anti-racism, we have work, um, we have to work hard on the left to engage with uh, black indigenous and other people of color. Um, Marx recognizes that gender and racial oppression, or rec, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark recognized that, re, that gender and racial oppression go hand in hand with capitalist exploitation. His critique of capitalism centered on the alienation that deformed humanity. And he supported movements that were not necessarily anti-capitalist, including the abolition of slavery in the US because he saw them as important struggles in and of themselves. 
However, in the US, the radical left has been mired with class reductionism. Although there are many on the left who support specific anti-racist and other struggles, major left organizations have difficulty attracting people of color. The term force and reason uh, uh, is, is coined by uh, Raya Dumiskaya. From a, from a global perspective, Black, Indigenous, and other women of color undoubtedly bear the bleeding hearts and hands of the most oppressed and exploited peoples in existence. And as such, they have the greatest impetus to struggle against existing structures of oppression, not only for themselves, but for their children and their communities. Indeed, women have been critical players in revolutionary history from the earliest workers' revolution, the Paris Commune. They have played key roles in organizing, providing pol political education, leadership, and even fighting on the front lines. Marx came to realize through his analysis of non-Western societies that the greatest potential for class struggle lay with the most oppressed and, and alienated communities who were not blinded by their false hopes of social mobility or inclined to align themselves with the white capitalist class. Building on Marxist philosophy, Raya Dinuskaya proclaimed that the history of revolutionary activity shows the black masses to be the vanguard of the revolution, capable of leading mass movements, providing a springboard from which other oppressed groups would follow and developing international alliances. She paid special attention to the courage and ingenuity of black women whose leadership came through in the fight against abolition, sprouting the feminist movement and in creating bridges with others with whom interests converge. Duna Vizcaya emphasized that it was the reason and force of black women that were critically needed for revolutionary struggle. Reason, uh, according to um, Duna Vizcaya or the way she used it was to refer to the insights and theorizing that black women, and I would argue indigenous and other women of color as well, bring to revolutionary movements. Their experiences of oppression and exploitation and their movement as racialized and gendered workers are key to developing an alternative to capitalism and a viable path to getting there. One that is also anti-racist and anti all forms of oppression. Certainly it can be argued that up to now the predominantly white and male approaches to organizing for a socialist alternative have either not, have either not proved very fruitful or have turned in Dunaviskaya's words into their opposites. Many important movements today are significantly influenced by the ways of being and knowing of BIPOC communities and BIPOC women. And it's important that we pay attention to what these movements teach us. Dunaviskaya argued that one reason why socialist revolutions turn into their opposites could be seen in the ideologies that were held among movement leaders. She wrote, being outside of production, the intellectual could not see that the working class had power to overthrow the contradictory conditions of production. For the intellectual, which many of us are, right? Um, in terms of um, having, you know, uh, advanced education or, or being able to, you know, have the time to read, um, uh, uh, extensively, right? Uh, for the intellectual, that proletariat existed only as a suffering class. Their lack of faith in the working classes often results in radical intellectuals who are forever planning to do something for the worker, sub substituting their activity, or at least planning for the self-activity of the working class. That was Raya Dunevskaya. It is the dialectic, this is me now. <laughs> it is the dialectic with which Marx, which makes Marx's philosophy of revolution a humanist philosophy. Without the recognition of the worker as a human subject, their concrete activity for change, which involves both movement in consciousness and in reality. The intellectuals theorizing remains disconnected from the actual concrete conditions and desires of those who are actually moving and who have the actual potential and impetus, the reason and force, right? 
to transform society. Daenerys Gaia pointed out that it is the workers today, these would be working class, uh, predominantly BIPOC peoples who are in constant motion, seeking ways to better their lives and who know and understand their struggles most intimately. Intellectuals like us must follow their lead, engage with and support and learn from their insights to understand what, it's po what is possible at this time, what next steps must be taken, what they can endure since any um, major movement against capital, any strike or, or that kind of work um, is actually going to be felt predominantly by these communities, right? So they are the ones who know what they can endure, what they can, and what we can offer. It is this dialectic, not just philosophy, not just action, but the combination of both, the movement from practice to theory and the movement from theory to practice that will help us create a path to becoming more fully human. Some of the most important movements today have been either founded by or heavily influenced by BIPOC women. Some of these include, of course, Black Lives Matter, which Dindi talked uh, quite a bit about, Rojava in the Northern area of Syria, the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, Idol No More, which is founded in Canada, the Me Too movement, um, which uh, was overtaken um, and appropriated in many ways by the white feminists uh, white feminist groups, um, but initially founded by black uh, women. Uh, and families being belong together, which is a section of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, predominantly um, immigrant women uh, and women of color uh, in the United States um, and predominantly fighting currently against the separation of families at the border. Um, that continues today uh, and trying to search for and reconnect uh, families that were separated um, thanks to Trump. Across these organizations, we're seeing that BIPOC women's particular engagement with the world leads to different ways of being and thinking about movement organizing. I wanna briefly discuss three important aspects of these movements that we're seeing today. Um, first, these movements have developed an organizational style that's being called horizontalism or the practice of, uh, Dindi uh, named it, leaderful organizational structures that have established varying forms of direct democracy. Rojava or the Federation of Northern Syria, for example, is organized around cantons that, res that resemble the Caracoles in Zapatista territory. Every neighborhood and town is organized into a commune that comes together to make decisions that affect the entire group. Each committee has an elected administration and elected representatives that come together in larger assemblies. However, representatives are charged with reporting what was decided by the commune, by the people. They do not make their own decisions for the committees or for the communes. Recognizing that democratic practices do not immediately remove the history of subordination of women. Some of these movements have created separate but parallel women only councils to ensure that their voices are heard. This is true in Rojava and among the Zapatistas and is one of the goals of the, no, of the Idle No More movement, um, which is particularly focused on indigenous rights. Uh, in Rojava, for example, there is also a women's protection unit the YPJ, which is a parallel women's only fighting unit that fights alongside men, but Argo also organizes in their own ways. And they have very different organizational structures than um, the men, the, the male fighting units in Rojava. Excuse me, Lilia, you have three minutes left. Three minute warning. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. As Dindi discussed earlier, Black Lives Matter has also developed a horizontal organizational structure. BLM activists agree or argue that today's technological advances facilitate organizing at a moment's notice, which allows them to forego the hierarchical structures of past movements. Black Lives Matter is describing itself as a movement that is coordinated and organized 
but decentralized. A second aspect of these organizations heavily influenced by women of color is their inclusiveness to intersectionality. Again, Black Lives Matter, for example, expressly recognizes Black people's intersectionalities. They have been active in educating people about the specific forms of exploitation endured by Black women and the violence inflicted on trans Black women and Black members of the LGBTQIA community. The recognition of the diversity within the Black community and attention to the issues that this diversity produces has been key to the growth and support of Black of BLM among different communities. Similarly, at the heart of the Rojava revolution is a vision of a better future that includes a secular government, equal participation and political voice for all ethnic minorities and women's liberation. In Rojava, the goal is for all languages and cultural practices to be accepted and each community has the right to become and to honor their own identities. A third invest, interesting uh, component of these organizations is that they're taking on the support of immediate material and psychosocial needs. For example, BLM Chicago has created a food box for food vulnerable peoples. Other chapters have, a different time, have at different times created spaces to promote healing from the, tama, from the trauma of oppression. There's a growing belief being discussed among scholars and activists of color that the individual and collective well-being of our communities is both necessary for, for, our, for our lives and for living uh, with dignity, also a form of resistance to our dehumanization and necessary for building unity and collectivizing our struggles. In conclusion- round, uh, Pardon me, Lilia, just round one minute left. Okay, in conclusion, the struggle against capital must also be a struggle against racism, sexism, and other forms of oppression. To understand what this actually looks like and what needs to change, we have to engage with the people whose experiences, who experience these oppressions since their manifestations are often invisible to those in positions of domination. It is crucial that the radical left become spaces that attract more women of color their, in, their diverse ways of knowing and being in the world may hold the key to helping us build a more human world. And with that, I'm gonna stop. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Lilia. That was a good presentation. Uh, we'll now jump across the country to Western Massachusetts, to Springfield. Uh, to listen to Heather Brown. Uh, Heather teaches as West, at Westfield State University and uh, she has written wi widely on Marxism, feminism and ecology and is the author, for example, of the book Marx on Gender and the Family, a critical study. Heather will tonight or today or this morning or whatever uh, speak on the development of all human powers as an end in itself, theorizing a liberatory post-capitalism in a time of ecological crisis. Heather? Thanks, Jonas. Um, so the, the title of uh, my presentation today uh, may sound a little bit odd to people uh, talking about uh, in a time of ecological crisis, sort of expanding uh, humanity's uh, sort of uh, picture of itself. Uh, the quote comes from uh, Marx himself in uh, Capital Volume 3. Uh, so the question I'm, I'm trying to uh, ask here and come up with some kind of answer to is, is it possible uh, in an era of seeming scarcity to have uh, this development of human powers in a way that doesn't uh, destroy the environment even further? And uh, the short answer is, uh, from what I can come up with, uh, that's really the only sustainable way that uh, humanity can exist on the planet is by uh, changing its focus. Uh, certainly, if you look at the world today, uh, United States uh, recently facing uh, some very severe wildfires uh, in the western side of the country, facing uh, increased threat as uh, many in the Western Hemisphere of uh, hurricanes, other types of storms, and uh, certainly similar patterns throughout the world. Uh, so uh, we're, we're at a crisis point, certainly. Uh, more and more studies are showing that, uh, in fact, 
uh, we're at a point of no return in terms of having some long lasting effect on the environment in, in a negative way. So uh, Marxist ecologists uh, have over the past 20 years or so, uh, such as Foster, Burkett, Malm, Sado, uh, all rightly pointed to capitalism as the key problem. Uh, the cause of massive environmental destruction rather than uh, simply humanity in some abstract sense. Certainly humanity in the past before capitalism had the ability to uh, have a profound effect on uh, local environments, but it's really only capitalism where you can see uh, uh, international, in fact, worldwide problem. Uh, and uh, the answer that's often given is that capitalism demands unlimited growth. And in fact, it can make uh, huge profits off of uh, environmental destruction itself. Uh, this unlimited growth is obviously not sustainable. Uh, Foster and uh, his school of thought have pointed to uh, what Marx referred to as the metabolic rift. Uh, this idea that uh, basically uh, humanity has become unhinged from its local environment and uh, has uh, in fact expanded in ways uh, beyond uh, what a typical environment can support. And this is something that uh, is typical of capitalism. And the answer that uh, most within the school of thought would argue is uh, in some way or another uh, that uh, basically we have to expand the role of the state. Uh, Mal uh, recently uh, wrote a book relating to ecology and uh, the pandemic uh, sort of making that claim, even though it's a, a very different state that he's arguing for than, than perhaps what we have today. Uh, that's the answer that's often given. Uh, and no doubt, if you're going to make changes, uh, coercion at some level is going to be necessary. But uh, should this be our emphasis? Uh, and the answer I would say is no. And uh, looking at uh, US politics today, uh, US politics the past four years, uh, we've seen how uh, coercion doesn't necessarily work. Uh, looking at uh, the pandemic as uh, mom does in the context of the US and uh, going to uh, a place where I'm very familiar with where I was born and raised in West Michigan, uh, which is sort of breeding grounds for exactly the movements that you see, uh, the rightist movements in Michigan itself. Uh, whether it was uh, the, the protests uh, earlier on this year at the state capitol, whether it was uh, the sort of uh, loose attempts to try to kidnap the governor of uh, Michigan and uh, uh, sort of deal with her in some way or another. Uh, it wasn't surprising to me. Uh, these are the people that I grew up with in a way. Uh, so, uh, and if we, we look at Marx on sort of the same point, what can law really do to help us? Uh, this from Poverty of Philosophy as he's criticizing Perdon. But the peoples do not proceed by royal decree. Before making these ordinances, they have to at least change from top to bottom their industrial political conditions of existence and in consequence all their manner of being. So pointing out exactly what some sort of communist revolution would need. So uh, yes, we, we do need greater state regulation. Yes, it is a good thing that we have uh, in the US Biden instead of Trump, um, but uh, certainly Biden not that big of a fan of the environment and isn't going to make the kind of changes that are necessary as would any politician, uh, any of those that were uh, running for the presidency earlier on. So uh, at best, we're looking at temporary measures. So human nature will have to be transformed in some way. I'll get back to that point in a minute. Uh, but another major thing that we see within uh, both the right and the left at some level is the issue of neo-Malthusianism. Um, the idea that we're facing shortages, uh, the idea that there's too many people uh, for the resources that we have. I think uh, I'll show in a minute, uh, Marx himself dealt with, uh, dealt with uh, Malthus uh, pretty adequately. Uh, the simple answer to the question, are we facing absolute shortages is no. Um, if you look at the actual statistics, uh, there's just enough in, in grain to produce, that's produced each year to feed each individual about uh, 3,500 calories. Now, I, I wanna be clear, the issue isn't one of distribution or is it simply one of distribution? Uh, there are reasons why those 300 or 3,500 calories don't go to um, everyone in the world in need. Uh, and in fact, it points to the strong social issue uh, that 
uh, a lot of that grain goes for uh, animal feed, for example, uh, for uh, less uh, um, sustainable uh, food production. And certainly we can look at uh, factory farms and that sort of thing and the issues in inherent in that. Uh, but perhaps even more um, difficult is uh, the issue of ethanol, uh, very much a, a political issue where food uh, is being used for fuel uh, rather than going to something that, that truly is more sustainable. Um, so uh, another issue uh, why calories don't go where they should is a uh, capitalist system food for export rather than for local consumption. Um, so certainly within new conditions where we're actually looking at human beings as uh, the key issue rather than profits, all of those things could change, as could the issue of uh, high cost, uh, uh, high energy use agriculture. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have shown that more sustainable agriculture can actually be more uh, ecologically uh, beneficial. Now, uh, getting back to uh, Maltus himself, um, I spent some time working on a project and working on a project uh, for some reason decided to read 600 pages of Maltus and uh, certainly don't recommend it. Um, it's uh, certainly a very conservative, conservative political screed uh, somewhere in between uh, the figures of uh, uh, sort of a serious uh, Jonathan Swift or uh, perhaps today some of uh, what you're seeing on the right with uh, what we should do with the poor. Uh, so Maltus uh, had his own political reasons for writing this essay on population, but he's often misinterpreted. Uh, his argument uh, isn't just that you have geometrical growth of people uh, arithmetic growth of uh, uh, food supply. That's part of what he says, but it's even worse than that. Uh, that regardless of whatever methods used, uh, regardless of your mode of production, as Marx would talk about it, uh, human beings will always outstrip food production. There will always be poverty. Therefore, we shouldn't have poor laws. We shouldn't have so the social welfare state because they're a moral hazard. They create more problems than they solve. The poor just always have to suffer, uh, is the basic message. Uh, so uh, reading a quote from Marx on this, is Malthus who abstracts from the specific historical uh, movement of population, which are indeed the history of the nature of humanity, natural laws, but natural laws of humanity only in a specific historic development. Uh, so we have to look at various modes of production uh, if we're going to understand what natural laws are for a particular time. Uh, going back to Marx, a Malthusian man abstracted from historically determined man exists only in his brain. Hence also the geometric method of reproduction corresponding to this natural Malthusian man. Hence inherent contradictions of population as well as overpopulation at every stage in history appear to him as a series of external checks which have prevented uh, this basic Malthusian uh, development where you'd have geometric growth. So the very structures of uh, society uh, within specific historical modes of production actually create uh, something that's different than the Malthusian uh, geometric uh, expansion. Uh, going back to Marx, the condition in which mankind historically produces, reproduces, appear as barriers to the reproduction of Malthusian natural man was a Malthusian character. He transforms imminent historically changing limits the human reproduction process into outer barriers, outer barriers to natural reproduction uh, into imminent limits or natural laws of reproduction. Uh, this is uh, from the crew de Riss. And uh, what he's uh, trying to get at here, I think, is the idea that uh, uh, Malthus can't think outside of uh, the rules of capitalism and uh, therefore can't picture something that's different in terms of population, in terms of uh, having a wealthier society for all rather than just the few. Uh, so you look at Malthus and there's certainly uh, very explicit racism in his work. Neo-Malthusians make it a little bit more implicit, but the racism is there nonetheless. The population explosion that's talked about is uh, relative to the global South. Uh, it's those individuals supposedly that are causing the problems, using too many resources or will in the future use too many resources. Um, you can look at uh, any statistics and see that's simply not true. Uh, even relative to population, it's uh, wealthy countries and in particular the United States that are uh, the biggest problem there. 
Uh, so what it would mean if you don't have a uh, track on population, if you don't control population uh, better would mean a fundamental change in the way we uh, produce and consume if we're going to have a sustainable uh, political system and, and economic uh, environmental system. Uh, so um, moving on to the issue of human nature, can we change uh, the way we interact with nature uh, or with the natural world? And uh, also from uh, poverty of philosophy, uh, Marx gives uh, a very short, concise version of this. The whole of uh, history is nothing but a continual transformation of human nature. Uh, that there is no such thing as uh, uh, a historic period of the Anthropocene simply because uh, human nature can and will continue to change. The question then becomes whether, whether or not we can have the full flowering of human being outside of the limits of economic growth. Uh, Marx shows how we become uh, basically anti-human or anti-humanist through the commodification of the human being. Uh, we see the value of a human mostly as a use value under capitalism. Uh, what money can be uh, made off of surplus labor. Uh, we're all replaceable and anything in the environment is replaceable. You use it up, uh, you find something else uh, that will work in a similar sort of manner. Uh, and uh, one of the things that Marx always uh, notes uh, quite frequently is the abstinence of the capitalists that's talked about. Uh, the abstinence of the capitalists is often at the expense of the worker, the environment, of uh, anything but the actual uh, suffering of the capitalist. Pardon me, Heather, you have three minutes left. Uh, the absence of needs, Marx writes, as a principle of political economy is shown in the most striking way in this theory of population. There are too many men. The very existence of man is a pure luxury. Uh, if the worker is, a, is moral, he would be economical in procreation. Production of men appears as a misfortune. So again, that point that we're not uh, looking at human beings as uh, the beginning point of our understanding of the good life, but in fact, uh, human beings are a cause of the problem. So uh, this instead of valuing the human and the natural world for non-mediated exchange uh, or not, not exchange mediated use value uh, would be uh, valuing things like love, creativity, beauty. Um, and a quote from the 1844 manuscripts from Marx. Uh, Private property has made us so stupid and partial that an object is only ours when we have it. it. When it exists for us as capital, when it is directly eaten, drunk, worn, inhabited, etc. In short, utilized in some way. Thus, all the physical and intellectual senses have been replaced by the simple alienation of all these senses, the sense of having. A human being had to be reduced to this absolute poverty in order to be able to give birth uh, all his inner wealth. The supersession of private property is therefore the complete emancipation of all the human qualities of senses. Uh, the eye has become the human eye when this, when this object has become human. When we can see ourselves in the object, uh, is what he's getting at. Uh, the senses have become directly theoreticians in practice. They relate to themselves to the thing for the sake of the thing. But the thing itself is an object, objective human relation to itself and uh, uh, to the, uh, that and vice versa. Uh, mere utility uh, no longer has uh, the same uh, position as it had before. So it's at Excuse this me, point. One minute left. Thank you, Connie. Uh, it's at this point that uh, Marx sees the, the real transformation of human nature and the true flowering of um, human individuality and uh, human nature in general, where sociality, empathy, and creativity are no longer at odds with the system, no longer working against the individual or society itself as it was other, other modes of production and fully universalized in capitalism. Uh, so nature can become a point of convergence between humans and nature today and for future generations, uh, if we think in terms of that sort of uh, flowering of human nature. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, Heather. That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, we are now Crossing the <clears throat> crossing the Atlantic and going over to the UK, to Yorkshire, to listen to a talk by Kieran Durkin. Uh, and I'm just going to introduce him quickly. Kieran is at the University of York, 
and he is the author of Eric Fromm's Radical Humanism. And today he's going to speak on Eric Fromm after 40 years in the context of Raya Dunayevskaya and Marxist humanism. Thank, right, Kieran. thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Okay. Um, nice to see everyone, especially the LA comrades. I miss you and your weather very much, sitting in a very wet and windy um, Yorkshire. Okay, so um, I'd like to try and build on um, some of the themes discussed today and some of the themes that I, I saw discussed in, in the chat um, by looking at the contributions um, um, to Marxist humanism made by Eric Fromm, who died 40 years uh, ago this year. And for those of you who maybe don't know who Eric Fromm was, he was an early member of the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research. So the, the institute that housed um, the thinkers associated with what we today call the Frankfurt School. Um, and Fromm went on from there after breaking with the institute um, to play an important role in the dissemination of Marxist humanism in both uh, the US and, and worldwide. And I, I'd like to look at two contributions in, in particular that I think speak strongly to us today. Um, the first concerns his extension of Marx and the Marxist tradition in relation to the study of authoritarianism, which of course remains um, very much a pressing issue for us today. The uh, second contribution, which is is intimately related to the first concerns from expanded um, conception of revolution, one that challenges class reductionism and also various forms of left authoritarianism and pseudo adventurism um, and argues for a focus on what he calls uh, a radical or revolutionary humanism. Um, and I'll start with the former, the former of these. So, <clears throat> for most people who maybe come across from in, in left-wing circles these days, um, they probably do so in relation to uh, his analysis of authoritarianism in his 1941 book, Escape from Freedom, which people in, in Britain and Ireland might know by the name of The Fear of Freedom. Um, and so from was part of, before he moved to the US, he was part of a group of, of German radical intellectuals who were drawn to the potential of psychology and, and psychoanalysis to help make sense um, of how it was that the German social democratic parties had sided with you know warmongering uh, and, and and you know eventually paving the way for uh, for fascism but on the way failing to force through a socialist revolution that would have um, struck at the basis not only of national capitalist oppression in Germany but have potentially united with the, the Bolshevik revolution in Russia and thereby helped to create the foundations for the end of capitalist domination on a, on a worldwide scale. Uh, Fromm had lived through the, uh, the First World War, the failure of the Spartacist revolution in, in 1919, but also the failure of the Hamburg um, uh, uprising in uh, 1923. The latter, of course, being one of the kind of decisive nails in the coffin for uh, the Russian Revolution as it descended into Stalinism, socialism in one country, etc. Um, so in, in the face of this situation, which uh, was, as Karl Korsch described, a, a kind of crisis of Marxism, from and people like Wilhelm Reich um, and Max Horkheimer, who we worked with at the Institute for Research in Frankfurt, thought that it was important to kind of challenge the, the simplistic assumption on the left that it, it was possible to kind of deduce ideology from economy in a kind of straightforward equation whereby class consciousness just automatically follows from one's economic position. Um, and this wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just an intellectual exercise. Um, on the basis of this kind of simplistic assumption that was held by many in the labor movement at the time, it was thought that, you know, um, you know, hyperinflation, the 1929 crash, the ensuing depression, etc., would necessarily translate into ideological leftist opposition. But of course, what you see rather than this is the extreme development of the right in this time in the form of Nazism. 
among the middle classes, of course, but also increasingly among the working class and the population as a whole, I think, as, as the, the movement expanded. So in, um, in Fromm and also in Reich, there's this focus on what can be kind of described as a cleavage um, between the economic and the ideological sphere. So this is the idea that the workers have both an economic existence and a social existence, and that the two don't necessarily exist in a state of harmony at all times or, or, or necessarily at all. So um, by looking at things like uh, family relations, religiosity, um, sexual inhibitions, gender politics, racial politics, and also kind of markers of petty bourgeois desire for things like improved social position, they try to make sense of this cleavage or division of, of, of the working classes in particular, that was their object of focus, um, that, that kind of went directly or, or less directly against their sense of class consciousness and, and militancy. And um, Fromm and, and Reich argued that, you know, the se sections of the working class of their day exhibited not necessarily a clear revolutionary will that became befogged for, for uh, want of a better word, but rather one that was partially underdeveloped and partially fused with reactionary structural elements of so nationalism, racism, sexism, etc. And that those aspects of social existence, which we of course may also want to say are effects of kind of uh, patriarchal and race, racialized capitalism can override the, the objectivity of economic existence. Um, and so um, through this analysis, I think, you know, they were able to add something to the traditional Marxist account, including to the account put forward by um, uh, Trotsky on the kind of retractable or switchable nature of the, the petty bourgeoisie, you know, the idea that the petty bourgeoisie would flip in times of crisis either towards the proletariat or towards the, the bourgeoisie, uh, bourgeoisie. Excuse me. <clears throat> so yeah, um, the, th this enabled them, I think, to uh, account for uh, psychological factors as a form of, and that was their attempt to try and look at psychological factors as a form of mediation uh, between economy and ideology, and to show that you know it, it wasn't just the middle classes and the bourgeoisie and the upper classes who came to support Nazism, but, but also sections of the working class um, in, in general. Um, and as, as Fromm points out in Escape from Freedom, it was, he argued it was the resignation on, on you know, part of the working classes following the First World War, the failure of socialist revolution, economic collapse, al alongside kind of um, socially conservative contradictions that already existed within that class in terms of their social existence, that all of these factors together help to create the way for the capitulation to and support of Nazism amongst segments of this class. Um, so they weren't saying that by any means that it was a working class phenomenon or the entire working class supported it, but enough did, and, and that, should, that should concern us. And so I think that the relevance of this study for, for today is fairly, fairly clear, you know, what from and also Wilhelm Reich saw with the rise of the Nazis um, and that we can see in many ways, I think, today with, with Trump, Brexit and then many other uh, situations we've talked about, is that while the basis of the reaction may be found primarily in you know, the middle classes and upper classes, those with most to lose psychologically and um, materially from the current system, the support has spread from their intersections of the working class uh, and in society in general. And, and there may be a sense um, that this kind of movement has been arrested or pulled back in, in the recent Trump election, but I wouldn't say we're out of the woods yet. You know, we're, we're at the beginning of another huge economic crisis. Um, and that while there are very much encouraging signs of resistance that we've talked about, Today, it's, you know, it's clear from the history that Fromm was talking about that you know an, an acute crisis um, has the potential to lead to, to barbarism just as well as to um, to kind of social social freedom. Um, uh, and that yeah, he was thinking about you know that 
when people are bereft of bereft of hope and lacking confidence in uh, the socialist movements of their of their days, then you know the will and when when the reactionary regime can unite this with problem bread bread, bread and butter kind of problems, then it will be a problem we we have to face. So we have to you know um, take greater strides, I think, in in the fight against patriarchal and, and kind of racist capitalism and fascism, which has always proven to be um, its ally. Okay, um, so the, the second contribution I wanted to discuss, which as I say kind of flows from this, is, is Fromm's um, notion of revolutionary humanism. Um, and so I, I suggested earlier that, that Fromm's analysis of authoritarianism, although most clearly focused on explaining Nazism, it was carried out in the shadow of and was influenced by the deterioration of the, the Russian Revolution into what was, of course, a form of authoritarianism uh, of its own kind. And this strong kind of anti-authoritarian strain you find in all of Fromm's writings um, helped define his relationship to traditional Marxism or, or orthodox Marxism, I guess, which, although it changed somewhat over the years, always retained some form of kind of critical emphasis of the kind of usage of Marx in, in, author, in author, authoritarian aspects of, of the Marxist tradition, and certainly the, uh, the Stalinist and Bolshevist tradition. Um, and I think his most important contribution in this regard is um, captured in uh, a passage from The Same Society, a book of Fromm's that was published two years after the death of Stalin, uh, in which he kind of critiques Marx's famous statement at the, uh, the end of the Communist Manifesto, that the workers have nothing to lose but, but their chains. As Fromm points out, the workers have also to lose all of their irrational needs and satisfactions which were developed while they were wearing those chains. So aspects of authoritarianism, racism, sexism, and other passions that we all know can be as virulent on the left as, uh, as anywhere else at times. Um, and so I'm not suggesting that Fromm was in, it, was in any sense the only person to kind of have this broadened concept of revolution. Um, those who know the work of Raya Dunyovskaya um, will know her focus on you know, the, the radical black and women's traditions and her, Excuse me, Brother Kieran, you have around three minutes left. Thank you kindly. Um, uh, and her incorporation of um, the 1844 manuscripts and Marx's later ethnological notebooks uh, in her writings, alongside the, you know, the works of, of Das Kapital. Um, so this kind of, you know, this broadened conception is there in Dionovskaya. You can find it to a definite extent in Marx, and it's also there in the humanist Marxist tradition in general. Um, and, you know, it's also true that um, Fromm, who became a comrade of Dino Sky and a kind of friend of hers, wasn't as detailed or as strong a Marx scholar uh, she was, but he absolutely shared this focus on the humanism of Marx and uh, the humanism that was needed to accompany revolution. And I think he does add, you know, something to it in terms of the psychological focus uh, of his writings. Um, you know, writings that are pitched to individuals as individuals as well as part of social groupings. Um, you know, so it's easy to you know, declare anti-patriarchy, to declare anti-racism as part of our anti-capitalist politics. It's another thing to realise it in uh, practical relations, relations which will be the basis of our kind of transformed um, social future. So I, I guess what I'm arguing here is that um, in terms of expanding our discussion of the subjective factor that Marxist humanists rightly focus on, um, that Fromm has this idea of like the fear of freedom, um, the way that individuals can set individual barriers that prevent them from opening up um, to, I guess, socialist and humanist and anti-sexist and anti-racist rela relations. Um, so it's not just ideology, but it's ideology mediated through um, things like the wages of whiteness, uh, toxic masculinity, etc. So we can't just, although these are effects of the workings of capitalism, uh, we, we can't just deduce them from capitalism in mechanical form, 
there's more human complexity involved and we need to reckon with that alongside the structural um, complexity. And so, yeah, just to finish up, I, um, I think Friend's right when he says we need a concept of revolutionary humanism, um, not only in terms of external barriers, but also in terms of internal ones too. So one that can deal with the kind of passions for uh, you know, authoritarianism, sexism, racism, um, and other forms of individual and social character that aren't necessarily going to, going to go away um, on the advent of, or immediately in the advent of a new society. Um, so I think he has this expanded sense of a dialectical conception here that we ought to engage with. And I just want to finish by um, uh, quoting um, from um, on the notion of what he calls total liberation. So he says that any attempt to overcome the, the possibly fatal crisis of the industrial part of the world and perhaps of the human race must begin with the understanding of both, of the nature of both internal or outer and inner chains. It must be based on the liberation of man, obviously of humanity, in the classic humanist sense, as well as in the modern political social sense. The only realistic aim is total liberation, a goal that may well be called radical or revolutionary humanism. Thanks. Thank you, Kieran. Um, now we're going back to the US, uh, to Chicago, to get to our last speaker, who is um, Peter Hudis. And Peter has uh, written the book, uh, Marxist Concept on the Alternative to Capitalism, for example, and also is also the author of uh, Franz Fanon, Philosopher of the Barricades. Um, the talk Peter will deliver tonight is um, on a talk. Uh, uh, he will be speaking on rethinking the meaning of socialism in light of racialized capitalism. Peter, you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the movement against police abuse and for black lives <clears throat> over the past six months has reshaped discussions on the relation of race, class, and gender, <clears throat> and that probably provides an opening to reflect on how we understand capitalism, uh, its relation to racism, and the alternative to both. So I want to begin on this with a comment by the great decolonial theorist, Sylvia Winter. She wrote <clears throat> that for the anti-colonial and anti-racist movements of the first three quarters of the 20th century, and I quote her, this is her speaking, Marx's prophetic, poetic, emancipatory project had been for so long the only ostensibly ecumenically human emancipatory project around. The result was that many of us, and us, she's talking about herself, a black woman from the Caribbean, had thought that what first had to be transformed was above all, our present free market, free trade mode of capitalist economic production exploitation system into a new socialist mode of production. The idea was that once this was done, everything else would follow. This change, the abolition of all forms of domination, including racism, was to automatically follow. Of course, it didn't, end quote. Winter is surely correct. It was blithely assumed from the second international onwards, both by reformist and revolutionary Marxists, that with the abolition of the private ownership of the means of production, the objective basis of all forms of exploitation comes to an end. Marxists who are trapped within this framework felt no need to develop a critical theory of racialization or even to put the struggle against racism at the forefront at many times of its political agenda, since it was assumed that the end of capitalist private property will spell its death knell on its own. This produced enormous damage when it came to adequately addressing the aspirations of people of color. So how does Marxist humanism, a philosophy that spent decades trying to free Marxist Marxism from the confines of vulgar post-Marx Marxism, offer an alternative to the misguided views of the relation of race to class that has plagued so much of the left? The assumption that abolishing private ownership of the means of production will lead to the end of exploitation only began to be seriously questioned after the Russian Revolution of 1917 transformed into a totalitarian society under Stalin. 
The industrialization of the USSR was achieved on the backs of forced alienated labor, while national minorities like Uzbeks, Crimean Tatars, Chechens, and Jews were subjected to vicious racial discrimination. Mao's China, very similar. They abolished private property, they had nationalized property, but nothing improved for the working class. There was no change of conditions of labor and had uh, and, uh, had Chinese racism, whether it be in discriminating against Tibetans or today discriminating against Uyghurs, ran amok and not contested at all. Now, given this, dissident Marxists like Rai Dunievskaya argue that a new form of capitalism, state capitalism, had arisen in Russia and China in place of the old, dripping from head to toe with the racism that has characterized capitalism since its birth in the 16th century. As she put it in her book, Marxism and Freedom, quote, the abolition of private property means a new way of life, a new social order, only if freely associated individuals and not abstract society becomes master of socialized means of production. <clears throat> the theory of state capitalism remains of pivotal importance today. It is impossible to understand why the revolutions carried out under the banner of Marxism in the 20th century failed to effectively challenge racism without that theory of state capitalism. However, while the theory of state capitalism <clears throat> remains necessary to deal with today's crisis of Marxism, it is insufficient. Donievskaya went further by asking if the abolition of private property and the free market does not end capitalism, what does? Based on Marx's early writings, as well as Das Kapital, she argued that the oppression of the working class can be ended only if, a, only if new human relations are created at the point of production in which the producers are treated as ends in themselves rather than as a mere source of monetary value. No society can claim to be free from capitalism so long as human relations take on the form of relations between things. At the same time, Donievskaya was extending, at the same time as Donievskaya was extending the theory of state capitalism into the philosophy of Marxist humanism, she wrote extensively <clears throat> on race and racism, arguing in opposition to many Marxists that the struggle of the black masses in the United States has an independent validity that cannot be reduced to the general class struggle. So the question is, how did she manage to combat class reductionism while not departing from Marx, as have so many post-colonial and critical race theorists closer to our time? The answer, I believe, lies in our understanding that the object of Marx's critique of capital was not property forms or the market, but rather alienated human relations in which people are treated as things. Racism is clearly the ultimate expression of being treated as a thing, since it isn't only one's capacity for labor that is thingified by the racial gaze, but the very being of the person itself. In sum, Donievskaya saw that the central aim of the class struggle is to transform human relations. <clears throat> In sum, because Donievskaya saw that the central aim of the class struggle is to transform human relations, she was able to grasp the subjectivity of anti-racist struggles that are in many cases independent of the class struggle. What defines the Mar this Marxist humanist approach is her statement, and I quote, it is not the means of production that create the new humanity, but the new humanity that creates the new means of production, end quote. If it is held that the means of production create the new humanity, the province of struggle is the proletariats alone. The proletariat is vanguard, all others are at best auxiliaries, feminists, racial and national minorities, LGBTQ people, etc. But if it is the case that the new humanity creates the new means of production, it means that the dehumanization that characterizes racism and sexism must be challenged and broken down in order for new human relations to arise that are capable of replacing the old means of production. Once class struggle is framed in these terms of a battle against dehumanization, which is how it was for Marx, but it was a lost sight of in much of 20th century Marxism, then what becomes illuminated is the subjectivity of other struggles. Women are often not at the point of production, and even when they are, they face forms of dehumanization unknown to the male worker whose bodies are not objectified in the way women's are. 
nor do male workers generally find themselves being responsible for domestic as well as wage labor while receiving little or no compensation or recognition for it. And when the fight is framed in terms of dehumanization or against dehumanization, the racial gaze, which denies recognition to the humanity of people of color, becomes a central site of contestation and resistance. Black workers very often experience a similar oppression as white workers, but as Franz Fanon reminded Jean Paul Sartre in a famous dispute that he had with him, and I quote Fanon, black people suffer in their bodies quite differently from white people, end quote. If race is socially constructed, it follows that specific social relations are responsible for its birth and continuance. What might they be? Fanon make, makes it crystal clear that the answer is economics. I'm quoting Fanon from Black Skin White Masks. Quote, it remains evident for us that the true disalienation of the black man <clears throat> implies a brutal awareness of the social and economic realities. First economic, then internalization or rather epidermalization of this inferiority, end quote. That is, racism is inseparable from capitalism. He goes on, quote, the black problem is not just about blacks living among whites, but about blacks exploited, enslaved, and despised by colonialist and capitalist society that just happens to be white, end quote. That's from Fanon. However, a phenomenon is not exhausted by its origin. Racism takes on a life of its own and defines the mental horizon of individuals long after some of its economic imperatives pass from the scene. That's why Fanon says the black man must wage the struggle on two levels, the socioeconomic and the socio-psychic -psych levels. Any unilateral liberation is flawed, and the worst mistake, he says, would be to believe that their mutual dependence is automatic. Unfortunately, that mistake defined much of the Marxism of his time, which is why he never associated with any Marxist tendency. Still, as Winter noted in the quote I gave in the beginning of this talk, Marxism remained such an overpowering force in the decades after Fanon's death in 1961 that anti-colonial and anti-racist movements could not avoid operating in reference to a Marxist framework. It simply isn't true that people of color have historically kept their distance from Marxism. The history of the 20th century shows that's simply not so. The problem is that the Marxism that they orientated themselves to, and the only one they could, because that was the only one that was out there, was a vulgar Marxism that ultimately failed to address their concerns. But you know, today that's no longer the case. The notion that you have to orientate yourself to Marxism has receded with the decline and the, understand, and the welcome decline of uh, established Marxism, vulgar Marxism. So then the question now becomes this, do we now develop a genuine Marxism adequate for our time or do we assume that we can get by without it? On this note, I wanna end by saying a few words about defunding and abolishing the police and prison system. Now, many understandably ask, <clears throat> is it really possible to achieve that? What is going to be done with the rapists, killers, members of racist militias who commit mass murder? Is it even possible to abolish police and prisons within capitalism? Surely we don't have to wait until the revolution to stop relying on the institutions of a capitalist state and begin practicing restorative justice. That's happening around the country today. And those efforts, which have reached a vital new stage in the protests of the last year, provide at least an embryo, indications of how society can be organized without relying on the oppressive power of the state. However, can we do so outside the context of developing a viable alternative to capitalism? That is, in order to adequately address the question of abolition, do we need to envision a very different kind of social transformation that then has heretofore prevailed in radical movements? Well, let me just frame Three. it this way. I'll be done Go before ahead, that. Perfect. Let me frame Thank the you. issue this way. Did any of the social revolutions of the 20th century, beginning with the Russian Revolution of 1917, abolish the police and prison system? Surely not. Even under Lenin, the jails were filled with opponents of the regime, while Stalin took that to an altogether new level with his penal gulag, in which millions perished. Did the national revolutions that followed in China in 1949 and Cuba in 1959 
Did they abolish police and prisons? Surely not. Did any of the anti-colonial revolutions in Africa or the 1960s that came to power, did they abolish police and prisons? Surely not in Krumah's Ghana, Siko Tori's Guinea, which was one of the most repressive regimes that became, uh, one most re became one of the most repressive regimes very quickly after independence, or Algeria's FLN. These were regimes, by the way, that Fanon was closest to. None of them uh, abolished this, uh, practiced abolition. They filled the prisons with critics of their one party states no sooner than independence was achieved. I mean, what does that suggest? Uh, to me, it suggests that the struggles that we wage today must aspire for a much deeper liberatory content than those of the 20th century. Here is where demands to defund police and abolish the criminal injustice and system and prison system takes on such importance. It focuses our minds on precise demands that, can, that helps bring the deeper liberatory content to the forefront of consciousness. By demanding the abolition of these forms of domination now and practicing forms of mutual aid and restorative justice that intimate alternatives to such forms now, we can help generate a social consciousness that takes us beyond the limits of the given and towards a new humanism. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you and thanks to all four speakers. Uh, great presentations, all of you, I think. We now have time for discussions, uh, about an hour. Uh, I will open it up. I'll just say that, I mean, uh, questions, comments, criticism, refutations, anything is welcome but no papers given. Christian <laughs> is very good at uh, uh, limiting the comments to around three minutes or something. I, I think we should stick to that. Uh, the way we do it now is that you put your name on the stack, uh, on the comments, in the chat, and then um, we go from there. So anyone who wants to say something uh, put your name there and we'll, we'll uh, take uh, three, four questions or comments and so on, and then we can let the speakers comment. I see Sandra, uh, who who's put herself on stack first. Um, also, just when, when you start commenting, please identify yourself also so we get to know who you are. Sandra, you can start. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, I'm Sandra Rain. I'm coming from Alberta, Canada. And uh, it's uh, been amazing to be able to be present and listen to the presentations all day. Um, I really appreciate everyone's effort. And I think it's initially I was like, oh, why aren't we doing theory first and then practice seeing my own bias come forward. And now as I see how the papers unfolded or the presentations, I really see the value of the discussion going in this way. And I'm just, uh, I guess, curious, um, any of the panelists could, could answer this, but is there is there one concrete thing that you've observed in response to the organizing, particularly in relation to the election and the electoral counting that's ongoing in the United States that has a particular um, theoretical kernel in it that we should hang on to. I think, Peter, you talked a bit about this in terms of how um, Black Lives Matter and this type of organizing fundamentally changes some of our sense of subjectivity. But is there one sort of spontaneous event that's happened that these panelists would link to uh, their particular theoretical contributions today? Thank you, Sandra. Someone else wants to make a comment or make a question, ask a question? Well, if not, I think uh, 
Peter, you were one of the ones the question was asked to. Do you want to comment on it? But you have to, that's also one thing, you have to unmute yourself before right. you're going to speak. I mean, I'm not sure that was asked specifically of me, though. So maybe we should, I see some other people are coming on stack. So maybe we should take some more. Questions. Oh, we can wait. Okay. Yeah. Rema? Rema first and then Kevin. So Rema, if do you want to okay. comment? Thanks, Jonas. Um, I wanted to thank all the presenters because these were very illuminating and thoughtful, thought-provoking uh, presentations. And um, it's, um, uh, I hope that we get a chance to also read them after this is over, if you're sharing them. Um, there is much food for thought here and I hope, um, so I just wanted to ask one question. There's so many questions, but just one, which is, um, you know, we all have these complex identities of being from various places, having homes in more than one continent. Um, and uh, also, you know, our gender, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as I was listening to Zahur talk about Kashmir um, and Pakistan and India, um, I was um, again reminded of the importance of building international solidarity movements and um, listening to what's going on in Brazil um, and um, in other parts of the world. Uh, definitely with the um, with the uh, the fallout of the Arab Spring, the continual um, continuing uh, development of uh, forces for liberation there. I wanted to get your uh, your uh, perspectives on what is helpful as people who are involved in movements as well. Um, what is helpful and what you think are um, urgent and immediate kind of needs for movement folks um, in terms of creating international solidarity because we think about, um, you know, we think about um, not just our um, role and our work within these movements as people of color, as, pe as women, um, but also about how we can uh, create a movement that is sustainable and that can be scaled uh, and supported, uh, especially because there's so many forces of repression, especially in places like Kashmir, um, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Rima. Kevin, you're next. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciated all the speakers, both in this session and the previous one. And one common theme is uh, dehumanization at the core of capitalism and really, well, especially capitalism and other oppressive systems. The last uh, few years and few weeks, and when seeing the voter uh, turnout, the voter results, it, you know, it kind of is starting to remind me of uh, the former Yugoslavia a little bit. And that's scary because this demagogue Milosevic came along and the Serbs always were nationalists, but he whipped that up at a time when society was falling apart and living standards are going down for the working class and the middle class. And he said, your enemy is not the capitalist class, but your enemy is basically these Turks and Muslims who are just alien and barbarian. And we have to kick them off their land and persecute them and stop them from taking over. And you know, the Ser that Serbian nationalism had actually been revolutionary 50 years before during World War II when the Serbs were at the core of the anti-Nazi resistance in that part of the world. And they would even point that out. They would say, well, you know, these other groups didn't fight against fascism as much as we did. And, you know, what about that? Uh, 
So what is going on in white America? Now, I, I, they're all, fo all, the man, all the dominant discourse here is the suburban whites shifted to Biden because Trump was too unreasonable. The data doesn't bring that out though. The suburbs shifted, but the suburbs are a lot more multi-ethnic than they were even four years ago. What happened was, as Lilia said, a huge turnout by Black and Latino people, especially Latino turnout, just was really, really larger. But also, a statistic nobody is paying attention to, and I checked it again last night just to make sure, white working class, as the, as the pollsters measure, which is whites without a college degree, actually voted a little bit less for Trump than last time was white America as a whole voted. So what we have here, I told this to a student, I, I said, you know, the media wants to blame the low, uh, the, the small number of Latinos who voted for Trump, the small number of blacks who voted, men who voted for Trump and the white working class. What's going on when they do that besides their class bias and everything? Divide Pardon me, brother Kevin, you have around 30 seconds left. Yeah, divide and rule, get these groups uh, fighting with each other. And finally, dehumanization is often we've been through it, but dehumanization leads to a sense of why humanism, revolutionary Marxist humanism, is even more important than we thought it was before. Thank you, Kevin. I have uh, Masur and Ayala on my list. Uh, shall we take those two, let them speak, and then uh, let the speakers comment? Uh, after that. Um, yeah, I just have a brief um, sort of connection with all the three presentations, you know, with Kiran, uh, Heather, and, and, and Peter. Uh, I guess this theme that we need to, you know, the humanity needs to be transformed before, you know, before we have a chance to build a new society. And I think it was different sort of ways that this came about, whether that's our relationship with environment, you know, as Heather was talking about that and Kiran and, you know, and, and Eric Fromm's, you know, concepts of humanism, Peter with this point that you can't really, you can't really build a new society before, before you tackle things like you know, um, dehumanized aspects or dehumanized um, way we look at another human being as a, as a different race. So it's just my point is really is we, we really are dealing with a very, very um, um, sort of a worsening problem, if you will, you know, and I, I think it, it'll, it'll, it really has to come to a revolution. I mean, aspects of that, I, I see in Iran, for instance, you know, that's something that may be a question for Kiran that, um, you know, with, with people getting less and less sort of leaning toward religion as a source of ethical behavior, as a sort of a sort of a, like a moral standing about the various issues. Like in Iran, really, it is, I know that it is, this has been a, this is a, you know, the Islamic Republic has decimated, essentially, um, sort of, you know, relations, you know, ethical relationships, because, you know, religion has been really, really, uh, um, has essentially discredited itself. And therefore, my question, Kiran, would be like, is there, what is it, do we have a conception of ethical? What is ethical behavior in new society? What is, what is uh, you know, is there even a role for ethics, you know, or not? Um, I know we, we, we don't want to be, you know, religious, obviously, but uh, I think philosophy has to be, to me, as philosophy has to be that source. But in the other aspect, there's just an observation about them, I'm, you know, I'm in the world of music, that I, I see more and more how this sort of, you know, people really think of themselves, musicians even sometimes think of themselves as being things. Like when they sing these days, when you hear the sort of the latest trend in music is that 
people singing almost like they're they're robots you know they act you know they're entertaining like they're entertaining robots you know they they have all this you know effects on their voice and so forth and uh it's like they are mimicking a machine essentially you know how they have really concept you know how they are think of themselves as being oh uh, like, like adjuncts of a sort of a, like a high tech way of uh, producing music so pardon me brother Mansour, yeah. 30 seconds left yeah i'm i'm you know so this is basically uh, my question is like you on any about you know, is there such a thing as a Marxist ethics? And I think Peter's point, um, you know, driving that. So it's a fight for really fight for sort of for anti-racist fight is very critical. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mansoor. Um, did we have Ayala? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm glad that um, at least in the in the end you kind of try to tie um, class, power, or authoritarianism, consciousness, and um, I didn't hear much about well, gender and race are part of uh, humanism, but I didn't hear much about the challenges that are new to humanity, not just humanity, and, and go beyond humanity. It's uh, the, the uh, disruption or the, the interference with the ecosystem and um, the pandemics, which plural. Um, and all of them, the way I see it is 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 very complex, but yes, um, it looks like the way it plays now, capitalism, rogue capitalism, is the main factors, the umbrella, and then there are intermediate variables. We talk about politics today and the voting as if this is. Um, a factor by itself, but when the whole election is based on raw capitalism, on the allowance, on the money contributed to, even to start with, to, um, to the representatives, and then the whole building is built on that, um, how are we going to change consciousness from you know, us and them kind of uh, orientation. And, and today more than ever, we need to do that because uh, universal or, or, or global, a new global um, cooperation and work together is, is absolutely mandatory, um, with the, especially with the, with the ecosystem um, challenges. So, how do we break? I believe that the first step will have to be breaking capitalism to even start any other change in uh, human rights, racism, uh, anti-Semitism, I mean, the whole gender, it's all a factor of um, treating people as instruments. Um, I don't know how how do you figure it out, Peter, for example, or Kiran. Thank thank you, Ayala. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, Pedram and Andres also on my list, but I thought maybe should we let in the speakers to comment uh, before. If any of the speakers want to comment. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I really want to. Oh, Pedram, just if we wait a little bit and let this, if the speakers want to comment on, on these questions so far, and then we can go ahead with your question. Um, Jonas. Yep. I, I'm happy to, to wait because my, my laptop crashed and I've lost all the chat. So I heard. Oh. 
I'm speaking in Yugoslavia and then uh, Mansur. So yeah, I'm happy to wait if others are. Okay, let's let's go ahead. But then then you can you can go on ahead then. Ask your question. Uh, yes. <clears throat> I really want to thank you for all the presentation. I think they were very eye-opening. Uh, you know, as we know, we all, all of us know that the biggest threat to, to us here or overseas, anywhere, is our democracy. And, uh, and also this democracy that is really ruled by capitalism. So it's really, you know, it's a vicious cycle. But, uh, you know, where do we go from here? Like Peter pointed out that, you know, we need to work on human relation. Uh, I agree with that 100%. I think that one thing that we can do because we not, cannot really confront this monster capitalism and its power behind it, is in a conversation, in our classroom, in our writing, uh, talk about what a non-capitalist society looks like. What is uh, the new society looks like? To get some idea, to spread the ideas. And ideas are very powerful. The other front that I think that we really immediately should get on, and this is not a structural change, this is not revolutionary, this is working within the boundary of the system. We really have to support groups, representatives, that are gonna bring some sort of uh, change to the constitution putting the president and our representative, basically senators, you know, what they did, we all, you know, we all know, I don't have to go to detail about it, what the Republicans did, that every, you know, every legislation they passed has to meet this, some standard of democracy, the, you know, support the constitution, not rather than their constituencies. And, uh, you know, we have to work in these fronts. And again, I appreciate all the presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, Pedram. Um, we have about half an hour more. And I have uh, Andres and Robert on my list here now. So, Andres, do you want to go ahead? Sure, sure. If you'll please tell me when my time's up because I don't have a visual. Um, I had a few thoughts about the comments that Heather made about the climate emergency and uh, the Malthusian argument that there isn't enough, actually that there's a surplus of humans and uh, a lack of resources to feed them or to house them or to take care of them. And I think that this sort of leads to um, using tactics, I think, where we can uh, subvert or undercut the modern versions of that Malthusianism. And um, the, the models that I've seen, for instance, have been in the indigenous struggles. Um, we want to take back what is ours. Um, the classic formula, I guess, to expropriate the expropriators. Uh, the, I, I, I think what we would, it would, for those of us who have any influence in the movements that we're involved in, is a is a a reframing of the the demands. I was really struck in the last period by some of the actions on the streets, where buildings were burnt down, where righteous anger was was displayed. But I, I had like a second reaction, which is, you don't burn down the shit that's yours. You don't burn down the stuff that belongs to your, to your own class. And I don't know if that's too far-fetched, but it's sort of a repurposing or a reconfiguring of our arguments. All of the um, innovations and all of the things that capitalism 
has developed in the last two, two plus centuries, those are ours. We claim those. Those belong to our class and to our people. And in particular, people who were formerly enslaved, people whose lands were taken from them and were the targets of genocide, and immigrants who were used as cheap labor and the descendants of those immigrants. So I, I kind of feel like that there's a, a way in which we have to subvert the narrative or we have to take over and repurpose or, or reframe it. Um, I've, I've talked about this one left group that likes to go and burn American flags. In the crowd that I move in, uh, working class people, that's not gonna go over. I understand I'm an anti-imperialist, but that's just not gonna go over with working class people of whatever race, um, generally speaking in the United States. And the last thing I wanna say is um, the Republicans stole this election because the Democrats failed the working class. The, work, the, the Democrats have consistently for the last 40 years been failing the working class with all of its racist you know, um, tropes, all of its uh, uh, reactionary grievances, it's because the, 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 the Democrats have been unable to really offer a plat platform or a program and strategies and tactics that would reach those people, even with the racist uh, rootedness. So I guess that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you, Andres. Robert? Hello. Um, yeah, I want to say a couple of things. Um, one, just on the raising of uh, psychology and maybe touching on comments about um, whether certain things can't be developed until capitalism has been um, destroyed. Um, in terms of the psychology, I did an essay at university um, not that long ago about um, racism in psychology, um, which was fairly interesting. And I read quite a bit of um, Fanon. And I think it was also interesting that in um, earlier forms of the civil rights movement, how certain civil rights leaders sort of um, actually took on this idea of um, black madness and even black schizophrenia into the movement and actually sort of took it on like not as a bad thing but into I remember there was a speech by Martin Luther King where he sort of said what um, Kieran was saying about from where he said King put it in the terms of there's a civil war going on out in the world but there's actually a civil war also going on inside our own heads um, and he went through it and he talked about Freud and said oh you know um, really, Freud calls it between the id and the super ego and things like that. So, I just think that's sort of um, an interesting relation there, and, and that really resonated with me. What um, Martin Luther King said about how you have to see these struggles as being, and I feel that when I would say that I'm not a humanist because um, you know there's some idea of old oh, you know capitalism is bad, but I think that I feel that rift in the world deep inside my own head. I don't know how other people feel, but I feel like that division that capitalism creates actually inside my own body. And I think a lot of people feel that. So I think it's, um, I'm really glad that Kieran's brought up um, in terms of from and um, the set of Freudian Marxists like Reich and people, because I think that's a, uh, a really interesting area that we should look into um, a bit more uh, and yeah just on the other thing about um whether how do you overcome capitalism i think when peter spoke to us at our reading group the other week he raised a really good thing about how marx always said that you know we can only create out of what is possible so the point is if it doesn't already exist then we can't make it so the idea that we have to destroy capitalism before we can make anything good doesn't make sense because if it's not possible now then it wouldn't be possible in the future almost so i think that's why when people have raised this idea of um 
the mutual aid it's like it's not to say that this is the society itself it's to say that this is what the society could be like but if we didn't have like if we didn't have this this is what an indication of what could happen then we couldn't even get to socialism in the first place the point is that these pockets of socialism we can see what they might be now and if we can't actually do that then we might as well give up in my opinion if we can't actually find human sort of find spaces within capitalism now to point towards what human relations could be like um like say if they weren't there then they wouldn't be possible at all thank you robert i don't have well okay uh, dave do you want to go next Dave, uh, you're muted if you're trying to speak. I can't see you here. Um, I just want to make a point about the American election in relation to uh, uh, Britain. Um, I think uh, uh, Boris Johnson pro pro probably wanted Trump to win because um, even though uh, Johnson and most of the ruling class regards uh, Donald Trump as a kind of upstart gangster in regards his uh, supporters in similar terms, I think uh, pragmatically uh, Boris Johnson thought that a, a, a Trump regime could save uh, uh, the British Conservative government from the EU and now that we're going to have, you know, Biden as president, uh, that's not going to happen. So in the last few days, Boris Johnson is um, sacked uh, the hardline Brexiteers in his uh, staff. And uh, so... Un until uh, uh, the Trump defeat, I think we were looking at the British economy going off a cliff at the end of this year. But uh, since uh, Boris Johnson doesn't really have any principles, I think he might do some kind of deal with the EU, in which case he'll be, um, he'll be activating uh, the far right under Nigel Farage and the like. So. And, and the COVID uh, crisis is uh, reaching drastic pr proportions. So um, I, I would say that next year is, is going to be, um, is next year will be hard times, folks, all, all, all around. And we have to, in, sorry, I could be more positive, but I think we have to deal with that. Okay, I, I have three names on my list now, Christian and then Nigel and then Ali Reza. But Christian, if you want to start and yes. take your time on yourself then. <laughs> I'll try to be fair here. I'm timing myself. Yeah, so first off, I once read that the United States is the center of police abolition as a thought. And so I was wondering if our international comrades, of which we have so many, you could go ahead and speak about whether or not in the UK, for instance, or in other places, there's actually much discussion about abolishing the police, the police rather, the way we do over here. Uh, second of all, with regards to the election and the effects of Trumpism, I think that we're going to have to endure this for a very long time. I think it's something that our international comrades should be very aware of as well. I mean, at this point, it's just a matter of, of rumor conjecture because he hasn't announced it or something like that. But I've seen from various legitimate news sources that, I guess, depending on the editor, say that Trump has either told people close to him that he will run again in 2024 or that he's seriously considering. And so, I mean, I think that even aside from that, given that so much of the Republican Party, the GOP, keep on asking him to go to rallies or in the case of 
the state of Georgia, which could determine whether or not Joe Biden could actually have a governing majority to pass really any major legislation whatsoever. I think that, I mean, we we still have to endure that and that accordingly the, the world will have to endure that. And then with regards to the year 2024, let me go ahead and still a point that Brother Peter Hudis made, I think the very last meeting I saw him, which is that when the pandemic is over, a Biden administration has to do something about the deficit. I mean, I think that even from the perspective of, of Marxist economics or capitalism skeptical economics, it's not good if the United States still has to endure a two trillion or two trillion and a half deficit. I think the last time I checked it this year, it's been two trillion. And I remember when I was in high school, the Republicans used to scream about Obama having, I think it was a $300 billion deficit. And since the Republicans want to continue cutting taxes, and since Biden is a moderate and Biden, he gives them, he gives himself a great deal of credit about working with Republicans. I think that's going to come from austerity. It's going to come at the expense of the poor, the workers, the people of color. And I think that could have a very negative effect on the Democratic Party's chances of keeping the presidency in 2024, especially if Trump, as he has done in the past, just keeps on lying that he doesn't want to cut things. So thank you. Thank you, Christian. Next on my list is Nigel. Hi, um, I'd just like to um, ask a question um, of uh, Karen. Um, just um, Karen, um, I when you were talking about um, the German working class um, and the rise of Nazism, um, what sprung to mind for me was uh, an essay by C.L.R. James um, entitled After Hitler, Our Turn. Um, but the question that I want to ask is, um, is, Kieran, do you think there's any relationship between the radical humanism approach of Eric, Eric, of Eric Fromm, which you outlined, and, and, Tan, and Antonio Gramsci's concept of common sense and good sense in relation to ideological struggle within civil society? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nigel. Um, Ali Reza, do you want to make a comment? Okay. Uh, I appreciate about all the speakers' comments. Uh, uh, I just want to talk about election. Uh, regarding the question of why Trump got uh, this many support in election, uh, some that left brought a few comments, which I'm not sure uh, answer all the questions. One is they bring this one, uh, idea of Corona didn't dominate in South during the early part of actually this year. Uh, second thing they brought it, uh, they said trade deal with China, which uh, create a lot of problem for farm farmers because of help government gave them, them to a, uh, they supported Trump. Third one is they say, okay, they, in Europe, European white, when they move to uh, US, they settle in South, and they usually, they have uh, anti, uh, uh, ID, anti black and anti uh, foreigners and all kind of uh, question which they bring it. But still I'm, uh, I'm questioning, uh, this is not all that we can say. In my view, uh, we cannot uh, underestimate the way people are looking at the government, especially new liberalism. Which is, and somehow nationalism trying to act like they are against them, they are separating themselves. Besides, uh, do you think if left wing of the Democrats uh, should separate themselves from uh, somehow middle uh, or right wing of Democratic Party, uh, how it's going to affect, can they do it? This is all uh, come to the mainstream, we won't come to the question. But 
still uh, Trump got 70, almost 71 million vote. And uh, you know some of the, even though they, they, Trump didn't get, Kevin mentioned didn't get all workers, white workers support. But still, we, I think we have to respond to this. I think one thing which we saw is Black Lives Matter, an abolitionist movement, brought some real question and trying to separate themselves from, from both Democrat and Republican. Uh, don't you think we, uh, actually some of the comrade mentioned, don't you think they have to, we have to try to push in that center. Peter really brought a very nice point of how uh, race or how, how uh, human, humanism is uh, have to be related itself to Marxism. Uh, or economy than economy where we just go, go from economic aspect of it. Uh, Pardon me, only around 30 I'm seconds. Gonna, I'm, well, I'm gonna finish it. Uh, well, perfect, so thank you. This is a question. I think we need to a little bit more uh, discuss about that because still it is not clear. We did not answer uh, the, this situation. We know we are the democratic didn't win land slide. They win very, very small margin. So lucky which everybody are against against Trump not for Biden. Thank you. Thank you, Alisa. Um we have about 10, 15 minutes left. I think Rosia, do you wanna ask your question and then we can after you, you can, we can let in the speakers to comment on these questions that have been raised and so on. I just had a quick question, I guess, um, or slash comment. I'm just wondering, like, especially based on what Peter said, and then also, I mean, others can speak, but um, just if we should start, like, this election made me wonder. I already cited May when in our IME to LA meeting, I spoke on class and race mainly, and also gender, but mainly class and race. And I said we should think, I was like, maybe we should think about the United States as a semi-caste society. <laughs> After this election, 70 more people, more white people voted for Trump than last time. Um, I'm just, I'm like, maybe we, yeah, I, it's interesting. It's like, I think, especially the, based on the voting patterns are, there's class divisions, but they're mainly along racial lines. And it's, a, it's hard to say, until there is more analysis, but like basically whites are pretty evenly divided about going, or like, should we continue the caste system or go another way? Um, so just say that, like, I certainly feel it. I'm university educated, but I've now been unemployed for 14 months. And this is the longest I've ever gone unemployed. I mean, I've gone, cause I graduated exactly during the recession from college. I, uh, the longest I've been unemployed before I think is 10 months. I've been chronically unemployed and I've been like, eventually it was like, my race certainly has something to do with this, particularly my name. But so just thinking of the cast or having a semi-cast analysis is helpful because despite 50 years of like some gains, this is very stubborn racial hierarchy in the US. Yeah, thank, thank you, Rosio. Um, if we let the speakers in, shall we go in the order you presented? So if Lilia first and then Heather and then Kieran and then Peter Hudis uh, last. If you wanna comment on, on any of the questions raised or so, if not, you can just pass it over. Hi, thank you for all those wonderful questions. I think, um, I mean, I think many of them are just, you know, like really thought provoking and don't necessarily, um, are not necessarily meant to be, I mean, we don't know, we, we don't have the answers really. Um, I wanna just, uh, and there's a couple of things that just um, kind of, you know, um, stayed in my mind regarding what all the various things that, that were asked. I think I'm not sure who it was. Somebody made a comment about um, democracy and protecting our democracy um, and how that's so important. And I guess, I, um, and I, I know it's probably not a very popular thing to say perhaps, 
Um, but I guess I just don't think we have a democracy um, in, in, in certainly in the US and, and probably nowhere in the world. Um, there's a great article, uh, although of course it's uh, from a post-structuralist perspective, which I'm not a post-structuralist, so you know, take this with a grain of salt, <laughs> but um, by Jody Dean, right? Where she, um, you know, really lays out how, you know, all the various sides, everyone claims this um, idea of democracy and everything is done, you know, both, you know, humanistically as well as dehumanizing in the name of democracy. Um, and so really questioning what that looks like, right? Um, is I think really important um, and not, um, because I think we, we fall into the trap. I mean, it's such a major narrative in the US in particular, right? That we are a democracy and that even though it's not perfect, it's the best democracy out there. I mean, even if you think of democracy just as a political, um, uh, uh, you know, in the political aspect, I mean, you know, uh, like, you know, our voting has a lot to do with, you know, who has the money to, you know, uh, um, support all of the, you know, advertising, et cetera. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's so not democratic um, that I guess I just don't, uh, uh, I don't see that. And so I think keeping that in our, in our minds is really important. Um, then a, a whole bunch of other things that were really um, great comments. Um, just a second. I think um, I think Rima talked about um, how do how do we create international, you know, sort of coalitions and a hugely important question, right? Like I don't have the answers, but um, I do think that perhaps, you know, there's a place in social media and new technology to look at that, of course. Although of course we have to be very critical of that and be very, very careful because it also, you know, is a, you know, technology can be used in our favor, but also is, you know, at the heart of surveillance and at the heart of, you know, um, oppression and, you know, uh, um, finding, you know, immigrants and, and, you know, deportation and all of these various things, right? So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of time it's sort of the Hegelian, right? Like it's, you know, there's something there, but, you know, and you can use it in positive ways, but there's also ways in which someone else will come around, you know, the right will come around and appropriate it. Uh, and negatively. Um, uh, I also think though that, um, you know, in the U.S. in particular, we're very, um, I mean, cultural imperialism is, a, you know, is rampant and we're not taught. Most people don't know much about any other country or what's going on in those countries, right? It's, it's just not even considered important in certainly in K-12 schooling and, you know, even even in the university, unless you're taking sociology or, you know, courses in that, in that field. Um, and so that is something we also have to push uh, against. You know, education is really important. Um, language, being able to, you know, um, do our work and, and uh, translate it into other languages so that it's accessible to other people and find, way, find ways to communicate, right? Um, across groups and-, and Pardon you know, me. Really, around 30 seconds left. I guess that's, you know, um, you know, somebody just very quickly, someone else mentioned the, um, uh, asked, I think, a question, but I think someone else answered it with respect to, you know, um, looking at the spaces that are here that are already, you know, embodying relations, you know, uh, sort of more humanizing social relations, different kinds of social relations that are not capitalist, right? Of course, uh, Marx talked about development. Um, and the next phase of development being um, something that comes in the womb of the previous stage, right? And that wasn't exactly the wording that he used, but, um, but nonetheless, I mean, yeah, we, we need to sort of find those and expand them. It's the negation of the negation, right? Um, anyway, that's it, thank you. Heather, do you wanna go next and say something? Uh, yeah, just uh, briefly with that, uh, 
a question and a few comments that come up about uh, the new society and, and how do we get there um, in, in terms of uh, the dehumanization that we already see. And uh, certainly, uh, as, as Leila was pointing to, uh, those uh, areas that maybe are, are less alienated are, give us a little bit of an example. But at the same time, uh, sometimes by looking at uh, dehumanization itself, uh, it gives us a picture of what human relations uh, can look like. Uh, that process uh, that talks about the sort of saying no to what to what's already there, um, and uh, that that's particularly important as we look to uh, the environmental crisis. Um, as I was trying to say, I don't know all that effectively, but. Uh, Really, a lot of this uh, stems uh, from our alienation from uh, the natural world and our alienation from each other. Um, that uh, in that uh, alienation, we're uh, sort of uh, taught under capitalism to uh, look out for uh, any way that we can uh, get our economic interests. Uh, if that means hurting others, that that's fine. Whatever that that might mean. But the, the basis of that, uh, I think Bars would argue, comes from our sociality and uh, the, the fact that we are dependent beings on others. And uh, capitalism, in a lot of ways, turns that around uh, in a way that works against us and against our humanity. Um, so we're using our creativity, our sociality in uh, negative ways or, or ways of uh, that, that don't expand uh, our humanness and work in the other direction. So looking at those examples of, of how we can turn around those issues, I think uh, might be helpful. Thank you. Uh, we are running a little bit late, but Kieran and Peter, you'll get your three mi minutes each also. So. Go ahead, Kieran, go ahead if you wanna Sorry, add something. I think I, I noticed the comments suggested my um, my last talk was echoing. I think I'm one of these people who um, speak on the phone and shout, so I'll try and be less loud here. I'm also um, one of these people who come nine o'clock, um, my head's kind of done. A strong working class Scottish family that either be watching TV or having a beer. So I'll try and remember all the, the comments and maybe quickly go through them. Starting with Christian, who asked, a little bit, you asked about the kind of experience, the British experience in terms of defunding the police. Well, I think I can sum up the kind of attitude of um, our, our shadow leader, Keir Starmer, when he was asked about defund from the police and he described it as nonsense. So I think there's a lot of work to do in the UK on on that score in any, in any case. Um, I wanted to, to um, come back to Robert's Points. And Robert, hopefully we get the chance to, to meet up in, in more detail in the new year and, and speak more about it. But I noticed you said that you, you didn't really describe yourself as a humanist. And I'd love to hear more about that because one of my, my kind of main preoccupations in, in academia as well as in normal life is kind of challenging this idea of what, what humanism is. And I'm, I'm, I hope and I suspect you may be more humanist than you think, at least on my definition. But um, I like what you said about the, the need, th those people, and like I studied them, I guess, in the form of uh, some members of the Frankfurt School that from deviated from, that, that thought there was a sense of total administration of society. There was a sense that was there was no way in which we could live anything approximating a form of the society we want, we want to live in the future. And I think that's clearly wrong. We've all had some form of kind of love or comradeship that is a nucleus that we move forward with. Um, just for time, uh, but hopefully, Robert, we can talk more. Um, I think I was able in my head to kind of collapse Nigel's comment and Mansoor's comment to kind of finish up my, my response. And, and Nigel, thanks very much for your question. I'm a bit rusty on my, my gram sheet, but when, when you refer to um, common versus good sense, my memory is that he means by good sense something approximating praxis. Is, is that your understanding? Yes, absolutely. So I think when I think of this kind of sense of, of embodying praxis, it, and you get it in from in the sense that although he kind of underplays kind of class politics in a way that I disagree with, uh, at the time he was writing to a kind of mass audience that 
and trying to motivate them to, to move in that direction and that thereby um, you embody this kind of sense of how you live in the world in terms of relations to other, other people and I guess across um, lines of you know, sex and, and, and gender and race, etc. Matter here, the matter in the here and there, and there the prefiguration of what, what will come. Um, but I could, could say more, uh, Nigel. Um, just very quickly on, um, in relation to Mansour's point, Mansour, I came in in the middle of your, your question, I think it was about ethics and whether there's like a Marxist or humanist ethics. Well, obviously, um, Marx himself kind of issued reference to ethics and morality, and he did so for you know good reason at the time. But uh, my sense is that we don't live at the same time that Marx lived. We live after the Russian Revolution, after appeals of Stalin to class morality, class kind of ethics, and and you know that that in some sense you know Marx clearly I think was an ethical thinker underneath it all, um, and that there is a kind of sense of kind of um, ethics or uh, ethics of flourishing ethics of Marxist or Marxist humanist ethics that would point to kind of the creation of free uh, free activity, free creative activity. Um, yeah, I could say more, but I don't want to take, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? Uh, first, on, on Sanders' question about a single event that illuminates something about theory that's important, to me, the single, I mean, it was not, not just a single event, but every protest I went to in Chicago from May, 20, from May 26th onward, and I went to quite a few, you would not have known that election was coming up in November. It was never discussed. There was never any signs for Biden. Nobody was passing out leaflets, vote for Democrats or vote for whoever. It was like, it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't on the table of this. Now, it didn't mean that people didn't care about the election. I'm sure the vast majority of people in the protest went out and voted, and I don't think they voted for Trump. But what did that tell us that there was just, look, it, it was a, an implicit realization. There's a consciousness that's embedded in those tens of thousands, maybe millions of people who are pro, I mean, I can't speak for all of them. I'm talking about my experience in Chicago. Is an implicit consciousness, or maybe it's an explicit consciousness, that racism, or killing of black people, and racism in general, cannot be resolved on the juridical level. It cannot be resolved on the level of bourgeois politics. Um, it, it, it just can't. So, um, so I know we're all concerned about the election, <laughs> and I know the election matters. Um, but we keep, we have to keep this into perspective. America is a very racist society, and it's always been a very racist society. So the question I have, this gets us now to Kevin's question of uh, comments. Did Trump change America or did he really not change America? He just made America be able to say what it was, to speak what was there all along. I don't think he changed the Republican party one bit. I think the Republican party simply like dropped the veneer of civility uh, thanks to Trump. But uh, we can extend that to American society as a whole. I mean, look, there's been important moments when mass mobilization has broken through this complete um, entanglement of racism in every aspect of, of human life in this society, those moments are like the Civil War, the post-Civil War period, the Civil Rights Movement. We can talk about struggles of the last and experience of the last several decades in one way or another, but they, 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 it's, it's like uh, they bubble up, they, they burst forth, but there's still this encrusted layer uh, that defines American society that um, is thoroughly racist. And so um, in that sense, maybe it's not all so surprising what's going on. Um, now, Henry Louis Gates, don't turn up your nose. You know, he's got some things to say. Henry Louis Gates, uh, the uh, New York Review of Books, this issue, I just read this yesterday, uh, has a, the latest issue out has a round table discussion on the election before the election results came in. Uh, and Henry Louis Gates has a very, read his piece. It's a very short, but very interesting piece. And he says, you know, thinking about where America is today, he says, it makes me kind of feel like, uh, what would, what did black people feel who went through the civil war and went through black reconstruction? And then starting in 76, 1876, saw it all come apart, all destroyed by white racism and lived it, you know, decades and decades and decades of Jim Crow. And, and he asked the question, are, are we looking at something like this? Uh, 
I don't want to be melodramatic or let alone pessimistic, uh, but why is racism so intractable a problem in America? It's precisely because of class. I know it's going to sound a lot of people are going to start running out the doors now, but precisely because class relations have always been structured along racial lines since 1619, right, in this country, class relations have always been structured along racial lines. And yes, class relations are the fundamental determinant to a society. It means that society is fundamentally entangled in racism from top to bottom. And so it's to, to, to push away from that is going to take such a fundamental and deeper rooting. And we have indications of what that uprooting could mean, but it's going to take a big, big uprooting, and that's going to be way beyond the field of electoral politics. Okay, uh, much briefer um, on um, uh, Mansoor on uh, Marxist ethics. Yes, there's plenty of people working on Marxist, Marxist ethics, uh, but it's not just sitting out there. It has to be constructed, which is why Michael Thompson put together a very nice collection a couple of years ago called Constructing Marxist Ethics. Uh, and I have a chapter in it, and there's a number of people working in this area, and uh, there's a, quite a lot of interesting stuff being done in that area. But it's a work in progress. Uh, and then um, just lastly, on uh, Ayala's point about consciousness, don't underestimate, um, and so I'm going to end on a happy note, uh, don't underestimate uh, the depth and the, and the importance of, of the social consciousness that emerges when you least expect it. And that emerges from masses of people just coming out into the streets and doing something different, like the protests since May 26. I mean, there is a new level of social consciousness that has been born from this movement in the last six months. The question becomes, you have to capture it, you have to develop it, you have to see where it goes, and there's no one group or one individual that controls that. You want to be part of the discussion and do what you can. Uh, but um, the consciousness is not, doesn't have to be given to people. Uh, it, it emerges from their experiences. The problem we face right now, uh, obviously, is that uh, with all of this great developments that we've had, it's still not enough to get to where we need to be. And that is the uprooting of the very fabric of American society from its inception. But that's what we're gonna have to, that's what it's all about. And that's what we're all working to, to reach that goal. Thank you, Peter. Um, we'll have to end this conversation, uh, unfortunately. I, I feel that there are more people who want to, to speak and so on, but it doesn't mean that the conversation has to end. We have still other forums and, me and uh, places where you can continue discussing. For example, a Facebook group, and uh, we have an email address also, arise at imhojournal.org. Um, we can write into and continue discuss things that was brought up today or, or things that came to think of or so on.